Uh, Y'all, are you ready to catch some fish today? I sure hope so, because boy, I am, man, and we've got a day to do it. We got sunny skies, and most importantly, we got calm winds, which has been rare here the last two or three weeks. Man, it's been cranking here in East Tennessee. Every day, it seems like we got 15, 20, 30 plus mile an hour winds. But calm winds today, you know what that means? That means we're going ultralight fishing, y'all. We're going to take our ultralight rod, some jigs and gulp minnows, and we're going to work a stretch of this shoreline down to the next point and this pocket back up in there it's probably i don't know quarter mile down or so we're gonna work back up in there we just gonna throw it everything today and catch whatever wants to be caught today hopefully a little bit of everything y'all so enough of me just pointing this camera at my face let's get after it buddy if you're new to my channel this is my favorite ultralight setup, been using it for years. This is a St. Croix Panfish Series rod. I got two pound test line on a Daiwa 1000 size Regal reel. On the business end here, the money maker, this is a 1 64th ounce jig head. It's a number eight size hook, and we've got a, if I can get hold of it, a one inch gulp minnow. Smelt color, which I like because it looks like our shad out here. It's kind of a gray with white belly color bait. And we're gonna throw at pretty much everything down through here. I initially, I launched in this creek behind me and I knew I wasn't gonna be able to fish that particular creek this morning because unfortunately we've got this nice weather day and guess what day of the week it falls on? Saturday, so every bass fisherman their dad and their uncle, all of them, they're gonna be out here today. There's probably 50 bass tournaments going on. So all of these creeks are gonna be just covered up right now, which the creeks have been, that's the warmest water, a lot of crappie in them creeks. That's kind of where I would ideally like to be, but not on a Saturday when there's 5 million people. So I come out of this one with the thought I would just go ahead and run down here to this next point to start fishing, but I'm making my way down through here and right here on this little rock outcropping kind of in front of us here on the other side of this little indention or pocket whatever there was a heron sitting there a minute ago he's flown off now i guess he didn't want to be on video no cameos for that heron but i noticed him sitting there and herons they ain't just sitting there for no good reason them herons are always on the hunt man they're always looking for something to eat so I know there must be some bait or some kind of fish over there for him to be stalking. So I thought, well, we'll just go ahead and start here and we'll fish our way down to that next point there and then work our way in that pocket. And hopefully it won't be covered up with bass fishermen. So we're gonna do this a few, uh, few hours this morning, probably fish for three hours or so. And the wind uh, is, like I said, flat calm right now. It is gonna pick up this afternoon. At least that's what the weather report says. And boy, when they've called for winds lately. They've nailed it. Most of the time, here's a fish right there. We're getting fish number one early in the trip. Let's see what we got. Bluegill, number one. Welcome to the show, buddy. I have been wanting to catch some of you lately haven't been able to do it just ain't been able to throw the ultralight much with the wind the way it's been but it is supposed to get up a little bit this afternoon but i'm just gonna i'm gonna fish this morning go home and get some stuff done around the house and i think i'm gonna try to make a bait run try to catch some skipjack this afternoon the skipjack have moved up river right now they're on their spawning run and so they're way up river and i did bring my skipjack rods with me today and i actually trolled them where i launched in the back of this other creek i trolled them out to where i got out here and i didn't get a single bite most of the skipjack that oh i thought i had me a little tap right there oh they were nipping me right here man unless i'm hitting a tree and thinking I'm getting bit, that could be the case too. I've done so little ultralight fishing in a while, I probably forgot what they feel like. No, that's a fish. That's a little better one right there. I'm gonna pull off this tip of this tree a little bit and see if we can 
get some more of these. But I trolled. Let me get him in the light there. Let me show you good side there, fish. That fish says he ain't got a good side. Let me just pull off of this tree. It looks like it may run a good ways out here. I don't have a graph on this kayak. I don't, that's a lie. I do have a graph in that front hatch there that I've been jimmy rigging on for catfish trips, but I, I didn't pull it out for, we don't need it for this. Don't need any electronics for what we're doing today. We're gonna catch a bunch of fish regardless. But anyway, I keep trying to get the story. I've trolled these skipjack rigs out there here. Didn't catch anything. It's just that time of year. You get on into April, they're making their spawning run, so they're moving up river. So uh, depending on depending on where you're at, if you're if you got skipjack in your body of water, they're gonna be way up river. Or if you're like down here on the Tennessee River, for instance, we're a series of reservoirs. If the top of your reservoir is a dam, they get stopped there. So people be catching a lot of them at the dams right now. So it's just that time of year. But I, you know, you never, you never know. When I'm in this kayak and I'm pedaling two and a half, three mile an hour, casual pedaling, that's a perfect trolling speed, not just for skipjack, but for a lot of species. I mean, trolling jigs, I catch white bass largemouth bass smallmouth bass drum i mean i get a variety of species trolling just throughout the year so it's never a bad idea to troll you some jigs when you're just traveling spot to spot so i brought those rods just for that today i'm gonna i trolled them out through here obviously didn't get anything wherever we finish up today which will probably be in this tree apparently is where we're going to finish up because i'm snagged but wherever we finish up down through here, probably be, I don't know, a couple miles or more from where I launched at. So I'll just troll my way back with them jigs to the car and I may not catch anything, but if I do, it's just a bonus for, for the day. That's how I look at, at trolling, unless I'm just specifically going out to try to get bait on that day. If I'm just going on a normal fishing trip, and I catch something trolling that's a bonus man we about to use something here folks after I get myself well I done spooked every fish on this tree if there was any more I can tell you that we're gonna try something here folks I've got me something new that's gonna be just the ticket for what we're dealing with today a lot of company, not a lot of companies, a lot of individuals out there make, they're at every local tackle shop, they'll make these plug knockers for when you get hung in trees and stuff to get your jigs, but well, I just pulled it free just like that. We're going to use it at some point. All of these plug knockers though, let me get off this tree here. We'll see if we can spook some more fish on the way out. All the plug knockers though are way too dang heavy. I got these, Trout Magnet is making these now. A little plastic piece, you put your line in there, twist it on, and it's a lighter piece of lead. Heavy enough to knock these uh, 164th ounce jigs out, or a 132nd, 1 8th, whatever, but not like the big, I don't know how heavy they even are. Two ounce, four ounce plug knockers, they call them there at the tackle shops for like getting crankbaits loose and stuff like that. So anyway, I picked up a, a, some of those. I'm keeping one in my life jack. I think I put another one in that hatch there too. So in the event we lose the, I forget what them things are called. You know what I'm trying to describe though. I, they've got a name for them. I forget what they're called. Jig knockers or something. But if we lose one jig knocker, I think we got another one there in the in the hatch. But hopefully that's gonna help save us some time on these videos by not having to retie when I snag. And I'm gonna tell you, 
you throw around these trees and brush and docks and all that. Is that a deer going over there through the water right there? I know y'all can't, I can barely see it and I can't zoom on this camera or nothing. I think that's a deer swimming across the river right there. I hear a goose down there, but they're behind it. That's a, that was a deer, I think. By the way, this video, speaking of video, I'm gonna just go unedited today. Since I'm gonna be fishing out here, maybe three hours or so. We just gonna go raw and uncut today, unedited. Let you see every cast I make from the time I start to the time I finish today. I didn't get out here right at sunrise because it was cold this morning. It was, I think it was around 40. Here's a fish. But feels colder than that for some reason. It's a damp 40. Another nice gill right here. There, blue gill. They starting to, they starting to get some more color on them now. You know, in the winter time, the water's cold. It seems like they get real pale. I got, well, I got oil my pliers and things are stiff. But now they starting to, the water's warming up here. The other, the other day, when I was out in my other kayak with the graph, water temps right around that 60 degree mark which is magical i say that and it ain't been magical for me yet typically 60 degrees for catfishing man it turns on blues flathead you start getting more fish you start getting big fish more frequently like it, fishing just gets better around 60 degrees that has not been the case for me lately i have struggled lately for the catfish i was trying to figure it up the other day i think my last 12 sessions of catfish catfishing i've gotten a grand total of two videos and one of them i basically just made a shorter video for my second channel because i caught a nice flathead on that trip but that flathead and one other smaller blue was all I got on that trip. So I'm like, what am I supposed to do with this footage? So I made a shorter video for my second channel, Kayak Catfish Highlights channel. And then I had one day recently where I went out and I got a decent blue and I got a few others, uh, you know, enough to, enough to justify posting a video. But most of my catfishing trips lately, and in my defense, in my defense, the weather has knocked me out of fishing a lot of days. When you fish out of a kayak, there's not much you can do in winds that are above about 15 miles an hour. You get days where it's 15, 20 plus, maybe more than that if the if the wind's gusting higher. Man, you're you're in for a bad time in the kayaks. So there's been a lot of days lately where I've either went out for like a couple hours and just got blown off the water, or I've just said, you know what? The weatherman's calling for a high wind day. That's the one thing he's been able to get right lately. I'm just gonna do other stuff today. But when I have been out catfishing lately, I have stunk it up, man. And I've hit a variety of places. I've hit the shallows. I mean, I'm talking like two, three feet deep out to 80 feet, I've hit everything. Backwater creeks, main channel ledges, points, humps, shallows, mid-range depths, super deep. I mean, I've hit it all. And I, I mean, I just ain't been able to get nothing going lately. This is a terrible slump. I mean, for, for but really the last say 10 years or so, I was thinking about it, I'm like, this is the worst slump I've been in in probably a decade. Especially for this time of year. I mean, you know, again, this is, we're getting up around 60 degrees water temps in most places. Fish are getting a lot more active. And you get a, you get a sunny day 
in a backwater creek that's got a dark bottom you know a red clay mud bottom or real rocky back there or something i mean that water is heating up a lot and i still can't catch them so i don't know i don't really know what i'm doing wrong but things just the stars ain't aligned for me y'all it just ain't happened so it'll turn eventually it always does uh, you know things you go through slumps i mean look at baseball players you get these professional baseball players their jobs to hit a baseball and they'll you know players go oh for four tonight at the plate but eventually they'll get the pitch they're looking for they'll connect and they'll get in a groove again same way with fishing you just you have your stretches of time where it's like every time you're going out you're catching fish you're catching big fish and then you go through times where mother nature and the fish say you justin you're getting a little too cocky you seem to think you know what you're doing let's just give you a little reminder that you don't know jack diddly poo about fishing or anything else and let's bring you back down to earth a couple notches and that's what these fish do so they've gave me a solid reminder here the last couple weeks that i don't know a damn thing about them apparently but but here here's the thing when you're in a slump you're not getting the fish you want or you're not getting the quality of fish you want or not getting as many as you want here's my best piece of advice for you this helps me every time ain't been possible for me lately with the winds but this helps me every time when i can make it happen i will go out here's your fish oh he's up boy he's mad at it ain't he he's mad folks oh nice bluegill come up here bluegill i wasn't sure you was a bluegill when you hit it i thought we might have had a little bass on or something nice buddy happy to see you there's airplane man over hold on on the story man an airplane man apparently he's got to get his camera time old airplane pilot for the wind there's just another heron over there there's clearly some fish back in here there's some fish back in his pocket folks that heron professional fisherman he's better than any fisherman me or you will ever become he has to be he, he fishes to live like I was trying to say before the fish and then the airplane man and then the heron interrupted us. Nobody wants me to tell this story, but I'm going to tell it. When you're in a slump, the best thing you can do to break a slump is to go out and catch fish. What's the best way to go out and catch fish? Ultralight rod and a small minnow-like bait. You can use a live minnow if you want to. I think they're more hassle than they're worth. Plastic bait though, small jig head, represents something on the bottom of the food chain. And have you a day like I'm doing out here today where you just go out, whatever wants to buy it, I don't care if it's a four inch bluegill or a five pound bass or a two pound crappie, I don't give a crap. I just wanna catch some fish today and I'm gonna try to catch a bunch of them today. You do that, you start reeling in some fish and it's gonna boost your confidence and you're gonna you're going to get that urge, you know, to get back out there after the fish or species or type of fishing, whatever it is that you normally do. And so that's what I'm doing today. We're going to get a big a tug on the line from as many fish as possible. And we're going to break our slump. So that way, when I go back out catfishing again, hopefully tomorrow, I'm going to be on it, man. Things are going to turn for me. It's like, a, like an old gambler or something. They're on a losing streak. They keep doubling down and doubling down. They eventually either going to hit or they're going to go bankrupt one. <laughs> so I hope, I hope we don't bankrupt ourselves or something. Speaking of gambling too, I ain't told you it's no Vegas stories. I've, I've went out with the intention of doing it. But like I said, the last, I think it's been 12 catfish sessions. I've got two videos. 
And so I've gotten to the point, my last few trips out, I ain't even trying to do any unedited videos. I'm just dropping baits down and hoping I get bit. I feel like I'm jinxing myself even starting to talk and turn the camera on or anything when I get on the water. But I ain't been able to tell you it's no Las Vegas story since I got back from my trip. And that's been a while. I think it's been, I guess we're coming up on three weeks now since I've been to Vegas. So that's how big a slump I've been in, y'all. That heron over there ain't no slump. He ain't missing no meals. He ain't running off either. He is not, there's a fish. That's the one that heron wanted right there. That's the one he wanted and I just took it from him. Look at that, look at the jealousy in his eye over there. Look at the jealousy. That's the one you wanted right there, wasn't it, Heron? I'll throw him back. He'll swim back over to you. Sit there long enough, Heron. He'll come back, I promise. That fish going to run home to his mama, who's hopefully sitting right over there. I'm going to make another cast. Fish. A shad and bluegill diet must be the key to a happy life. There he goes. I made him mad. He mad at me. Them herons are always super skinny. You never see an obese heron. So eating shad and bluegill must be the key to a, a slim, a low body fat, slim figure. I, I probably shouldn't tell this story. But talking about the skinny heron has prompted it in my mind. Like I said, I'm going to tell you some Las Vegas stories today in, or, in about the fish catching and stuff. So we might as well piss off a big portion of my audience right away. So going out there to Las Vegas. Here's a fish. Oh, he's coming right at Oh, he come off. He was swimming right at me. We're in this little pocket here and it's real shallow. There's some wood and debris back here. There's some more trees that's falling in right here. There's probably a bunch of snags waiting on us down there, but we're gonna fish it. Let's see if we can get a hold of some stuff back in here. Boy, I've cued that up perfectly, man. Cued that snag up perfectly. He that snag heard me say it. And he said, that's my cue. We got it back. It's over here. I ain't gonna let that jig fall far. I don't know how deep we are, but it can't be very deep. I'm just gonna, just gonna swim it a little bit. If I got some depth, I like to let that jig fall. Just let it sink down. You catch a bunch of fish on the fall, but when you're, when you're fishing real shallow, like I'm assuming we are right now, Kind of got to swim it. You don't, you don't have enough depth to really let it fall much. But anyway, that heron, that skinny heron, that eats shad and bluegill all day and keeps a Barbie doll-like girlish figure, just prompted a story in my mind of my day one Las Vegas vacation from about, I guess, almost three weeks ago now. So anyway. Oh my gosh, I've done it again, y'all. Nobody, this, this may be the universe's way of telling me don't tell the story because I'm going to piss a bunch of people off. Hold on, let's get our snag back. We might try our new fancy micro jig plug knocker here. Well, I guess we're going to be moving on because I'm going to turn this prop on my pedal drive through here. We're going to spook any fish that was sitting over here. Let me get this jig back and I'm on. There we go. Universe be damned. I'm telling this story. I'm going to alienate a big portion of my audience. So we get on the airplane and we were flying out of Knoxville by Allegiant Airlines. Because Allegiant, while not the most reputable airplane, airline service, they are the only airline out of Knoxville, Tennessee that flies directly to Las Vegas. 
any of the other airlines, you have to do a layover somewhere, which means you're stuck in another airport, probably going to get delays, you know. The more, the more stops you have on your flight, especially at big hubs, larger airports, the more likely you are to be held up somewhere. So anyway, got a direct flight to Las Vegas. Typically, uh, it's about four hour flight each way. Three hours and 50 minutes, something like that. You know, it's it's four hour flight basically. And get on this plane and the way these Allegiant, I don't know what kind of plane it is, but there's there's no like first class, no business class seats, nothing like that. It's just all the way back from row one, all the way back to the crapper is three seats on each side of the aisle. So me and the girlfriend, we're on this flight and we know before we ever get to airport, like we're going to have to sit with somebody we don't know. We're going to have to because there's three seats and these planes, they only run to Vegas. They do like, it's not an everyday thing. Like they leave out on Friday, they come back on Monday. That's their schedule. So these flights are always full because of that. So whoever you stuck sitting with, you're with them. Like there's, there's not going to be an open seat for them to move to. And so the fear when you get on an airplane is that you're either going to be beside somebody that's really large or somebody that's really nasty and you're going to be stuck with them there. And these airplane seats, and this, and this is true of all the airlines, they keep getting smaller as America keeps getting bigger as far as human beings go. Airplane seats keep getting smaller. So we're back here and <laughs> we sat down in the seat and man, you know, I'm not a big guy. I mean, I'm tall, but I'm not, you know, I'm like 180 something pounds right now. I'm probably average for my height at 6'1", give or take. But like this seat is so narrow, like my butt cheeks on the edge of the seat. Like I take up the whole seat. That's how small these seats are. But the woman I'm set beside on this flight, y'all, she's so big. And, and listen, I ain't, this is where I'm gonna get myself in trouble. I ain't, listen, I ain't trying to fat shame nobody. I'm not, listen, I, let me just preface this story. I ain't fat shaming nobody. I don't care if somebody's fat. It's 2024. You can be whatever the hell you want to be in 2024. If you want to be fat, go be fat. I don't give a crap. So I'm not bashing this woman because of her weight. I'm not upset with her because of her weight. I'm upset at the situation. So when I tell the story, understand I ain't, don't come after me trying to cancel me in the comment box. I ain't talking bad about this woman for being large. I don't care that she's large. I only care that I have to sit beside her on a cramped airplane while she's so large. So anyway, now that we've prefaced that so I don't get myself canceled, I'm sitting beside this woman. She's so big. This woman is so fat. You know how you have them armrests in between the seats that'll fold down? There's fish. Nope. Well, I set the hook on a snag. We may not get that in back because I said it good. I thought for sure. I, okay, there it comes. I thought for sure that was a fish. I must have, my jig must have hit it. Felt like a bite. You see how much I've fished lately. I can't tell the difference between a tree and a fish. But this woman's so fat. You can't put the armrest down because she can't fit between the armrests. I'm thinking, oh my God, you know, I'm... I ain't saying nothing, but I'm giving my girlfriend the look like this is going to be four hours of this woman all up on me, you know? Cause I mean, like she's coming in my, again, my ass, my ass cheeks are on the edge of the seat on my seat. This woman's like, she's on me, man. Cause she can't, what can she do? So I'm already, man, we're on this airplane and I think I've talked about it in one of these videos. Like I'm, I'm a little claustrophobic. Like being on an airplane itself don't bother me. But 
when I'm in this seat and I got somebody like laying on me and I can't go forward and I can't go up because that roof of that airplane, you know, you I can't even stand up with my seat. You know, I got to duck my head to be able to get out the aisle. Like I'm already just a little on edge, just how I am on this airplane because of the situation. And now I got this fat woman beside me that's all up on me. And I'm like, oh my gosh, this is gonna be the worst four hours of my life. And so the plane takes off and we're not even up to like cruising altitude yet. You know, when you're on an airplane and you, you take off, the the plane like you looking up kind of you can see the, the like the front of the plane's at an angle that's you're taking off and then you get up to your cruising altitude for most of the flight and then you descend right we're still on the incline like we're not even up to cruising altitude yet this woman beside me is already busting out the snacks and like i'm looking what we got going on with my line here There we go. Like I'm looking at what she's eating on these snacks and I'm like, she's eating this early into a four hour flight. There's no way we're making it to Vegas without her, without her farting all over us. You know, like she's going to be farting over here. It's going to be stinking up the joint. So I, you know, here I am. I got about a hundred pounds of adipose tissue cramping all over me over here on, on, on my right side. I'm just knowing I'm about to get farted on and I'm claustrophobic. I mean, that summed up my four hours of the, one of the most miserable flights that I've ever had. And the whole time I'm thinking again, these flights, they don't run every day. You know, you go out on a Friday, you come back on a Monday. So most of the people that you go out on the flight with, you're gonna see them when you come back. It's gonna be mostly the same people. And I'm like, oh my God, am I going to be stuck by this woman again? I told the girlfriend, I'm like, look, if we get her again, I took one for the team on the way out there. But if we sit beside her again on the way back, you're dealing with it. I'm like, you know, we, we got to draw a line somewhere here. We got to, we got to split up the, we got to split this up. I can't do it two times. Thankfully on the way back, it was... It was another guy that was way too big for his seat, but I got stuck setting aside. But he was at least more courteous with it. He tried to lean more toward the aisle. I could tell, like, he knew. This woman, the first woman, she didn't give a crap about being, I mean, granted, she can't, I ain't gonna say she can't help being fat because eat less, exercise more, whatever. But she chooses to be, if, like, again, I don't, again, I don't care. If you want to choose to be fat in 2020, be whatever the hell you want to. I don't care. But she didn't care about being fat all over me is what I'm getting at. The dude on the plane back, he was more courteous. Like he would try to lean more toward the aisle with the exception of when the flight attendants was doing the beverage service or whatever. You know, obviously you got to come back in your seat a little more then so they can get up and down. But he was more courteous about it. There's a fish. Oh, this ain't a bluegill right here, folks. I don't know what it is. I hope it ain't no channel cat, but it's a little bigger, a little bigger fish right here. I think it's a channel cat. At first I thought it might've been head shakes I was feeling, but it's not like it's not like that kind of head shake it's more it feels like more like maybe a roll i think we may have a channel cat i don't want him to break off because i i want to see what he is to confirm but i think we may have well either way it's a we're going to be in for a battle here with an ultralight and two pound line it's going to take a little bit i'm going to pull off this area try to get him out here more in open water so you don't get any trees or brush that have fallen off here this we're, we're getting here now kind of on this bluff wall 
And so it's going to drop off significantly deeper a lot quicker. But there still could be some trees and stuff coming out as we make our way down over here. I don't want him getting in. See any two pound line and abrasion just don't, it don't work out. And then we'll get back to talking about fat people on planes. This fish is, he ain't never been on a plane in his life. He watched that movie, Snakes on a Plane, where all them anacondas got loose. And he said he wasn't ever getting on an airplane. Snakes on a plane ruin a lot of people from flying. The same way that Jaws ruined a lot of people from going to the beach back in the 80s. There was times when I was a kid, after watching Jaws, I didn't even want to get in a swimming pool. You'd see a cloud pass over in the sky and it put off that shadow on the water and you'd think Jaws had you. I mean, I can remember being scared in the pool as a kid because of Jaws in a dang swimming pool. I mean, there ain't no shark in a swimming pool. That's not even logical. But Jaws done that to me. Yeah, channel cat. Oh, channel kitty, come here. Them jigs ain't for you, channel cat. I've told you it's a hundred times. None of my baits are for you, channel cats. Unless I'm fishing on Sandusky Bay in a catfish tournament, I don't want to see no channel cat. Come here. Don't break my line either. I got you this close. I don't want to lose my jig. Okay, we got it. I'm going to let it slide this one time, channel cat. If you give me that jig back, I'm going to forgive you. Don't bend my hook out either. I don't want to tear my gulp, and I don't want to bend my hook. I'm going to end up doing both. No, hey, 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 act like somebody. This, this fish, he sits around all day watching terrible horror movies like Snakes on a Plane, and he don't know how to act. There. Hold yourself out there in the light. Some people out there like you channel cats. They defend you in my comment box. I don't know why, but they do. Let's take a look here, see what we've done. Did we, we did not bend our hook, but we did tear our gulp. So let's get us a new one on. Got my pea cup here, full of gulp minnows. We got a plenty big enough supply for all the fish we're gonna catch today and well truth be told for the next few months a couple jars of gulp minnows will last me a long time usually get i don't know how many fish we get per per minnow it varies the average probably ain't very good but the average will get brought down by snags if we looked at the fish caught on the gulps that I actually get full use out of, you probably get 10, 12, 15 fish per gulp. Look at it like that. All right, second species of the day, channel cat. Could have done without him though. Any of them big fish on an ultralight are fun though. It's a, the, one of the things I like about ultralight fishing and using the two pound line is when you get a bigger fish on like that, that's going to put your gear to the test. It's rewarding to catch a fish like that. Not, not necessarily, I ain't talking about channel cat, but just a larger fish on the lighter tackle because the fish have a chance, I guess. If you're using you see, we may see some bass fishermen in here today. They're doing their power fish and their spinner baits, chatter baits. They got a 50 pound braid on there and fish hits and they yank that fish out the water two seconds, the fight's over. Like, you know, the fish, unless he just don't bite the hook, he ain't got a chance. This is at least you get a big fish on this they've got a chance they run you over a 
a, a log or a rock or something, they're going to break that line. Trying to get hold of a channel cat here at the side of the kayak like that. We got hold of that line. He shakes his head. He could break it. I mean, that happens. So they, they, got a, they got a chance. So when you land one like that in that situation, it just, I don't know, it gives you a little something extra, I guess is what I'm trying to get at. I think that's part of the enjoyment of it for me is that, that challenge of it. I'm weird like that, I guess. But I think everybody, if you give it a chance, will like you some ultralight fishing. I mean, even the smaller bluegill that we've caught today have been a good time. Everything out here is a good time right now, except those geese. We're not even being pestered by bass fishermen, but the geese, the geese are like the, the large people on planes that's all up on you, man. But I don't know what the solution is for these airplanes. The airplanes need to take some responsibility, obviously, because they keep making the seats smaller. But if they don't, they're trying to cram on as many people on these planes as possible. And doing that helps keep the cost down. It's still way too expensive, but you know what I'm trying to say, like if they reduce the amount of people you can put on planes and they've got to get X amount of dollars to cover cost and be profitable and pay their CEOs gazillions of dollars, well, if you got less seats, then each seat's going to cost more. That's just the way it works, supply and demand, right? So I don't want to pay more, but also don't want to have somebody all up on me. And, you know, people in the comment box, I can hear them now. Well, they're going to be like, well, why don't, if, you, if you're bothered by it, why don't you just pay for a first-class seat or a business seat or whatever, Justin? Well, they ain't nothing on Allegiant to do that. You can't because it's three seats in a row all the way across. I mean, I guess you could buy a third seat, buy that other seat or something, but why should I have to do that? If a person can't fit in their seat, why don't they have to buy the extra seat? You know what I mean? Like, and again, I ain't, I ain't trying to put a tax on being large, which is essentially what you're doing. If you tell a larger person, they're going to need to buy two seats, but why the heck do I have to pay full price for my seat when I'm only getting to use about half of it when I can't even put the armrest down because the person beside me can't fit between the armrests? So I don't know what the answer is. I, I don't. There's not a good answer. There's not a good solution. But there needs to be something done about it. And right now, all these airplanes, they're having the doors pop off. Bolts are coming loose. Windows are cracking mid-flight. You know, they got a lot of stuff going on. The size of the seat's the least of their concern right now. But that woman, when that woman pulled out her snacks as we were on the climb, I just knew when I was worried about her farting all over me, before we got to Vegas, I wasn't worried about the doors falling off the plane in route. And I was, I mean, I wasn't thinking about it at the time, but if I had been, I'd almost hope that there would have been a, here's a fish, that there would have been a crack in the window to air the place out. Let's see what this is. We on this bluff wall right here now. Fish, you got yourself all wrapped up here with you with your fin he was just hanging out on this i wasn't sure if there'd be a lot of fish on the bluff walls right now here in the main channel i know the creeks are a few degrees warmer and there's a lot of crappie in the creek so i wasn't sure but i saw that heron over there first thing i thought well let's just fish our way down through here and we're getting some bites man Yeah, y'all, I don't know. I don't know what the answer is. But there needs to be some answer to it. But anyway, the guy on the way back was a lot more courteous. He would try to lean more toward the aisle. The only issue I really had with him was he kept dozing off. And every time he would doze off, his legs would spread. Like, he was trying to be courteous and, like, keep his legs together in the confined space we had but when he would doze like his leg would be all over me and i'd have his tree trunk laying on me and so i kind of elbow him i kept trying to wake him up just 
you know, accidentally bumping into him as I would shift in my seat, but it'd wake him up and he'd get his leg off of me. But the flight home, it wasn't nearly as bad as the flight out, which is unusual. Most of the time when you're coming home from vacation, it's always blah, you know, nobody wants to come home from vacation. But flight home, way more comfortable. So anyway, y'all uh, out there in Las Vegas, I hit the wheel of fortune a few times, slot machine, but I didn't, I didn't win overall. I come home a loser. I was down about hundred dollars or so gambling for the trip, which ain't bad. I kind of look at that as like a just entertainment expense. A better gambler than me would have got up and walked away. You'd play the wheel of fortune, get up a few bucks, cash out. Not me. I hit that wheel of fortune and I want to hit it again. And so I'll just keep spinning and spinning and spinning. And if you play them slot machines long enough, even if you win a little bit, you're going to end up losing. That's just the strategy of it. They try to keep you playing as long as they can so they can eventually clean you out your money. They, they hint around, they tease you with that 200 something thousand dollar jackpot. I think that's what the wheel of fortune machine that I was at was the, the, the main jackpot for it. But nobody ever hits that but they tease you with that to keep you playing until you lose all your money. But I was down about $100 or so on the trip. The, the girlfriend actually won. She was up a little bit. Not much, but a little bit. She, on the last day we were there, we had some time to kill before the flight left. And so she went to the roulette table and put $50 on red. She actually made a few bets at the roulette table, but she ended up when we left that roulette table, she was up about 20 something dollars that time, but she was up a little bit for the trip overall. When it comes to gambling, I don't know why this is, but it's a fact. Women, always more lucky than men. When you see a degenerate gambler, somebody that's down on their luck, has lost everything at a casino, it's always a man. You never see a woman like that. When you're at the craps table, and you see somebody blowing on the dice like they hold the dice over and they're like hey honey blow on these for good luck they ain't never holding it over to a man it's always a woman they they want blowing on the dice for good luck women are just luckier when it comes to gambling i don't know why it is but it's fact now here get this though here's a story for you get out of here geese i got a story to tell now them geese upset they don't have no geese don't have fingers they can't they can't push the button on the slot machine all they can do is watch other people and it ain't nearly as much fun to watch people gamble as it is to gamble yourself yeah they're they're heading farther down they don't want to hear this story they can't they can't push the button on the slot machine and they also they don't have thumbs so they can't scratch off a, a lottery ticket here at home either which is what i did so let me tell you this so as bad as luck oh there's that deer that swam across there's bambi right there see that deer oh i got a fish i'm pointing out bambi and we got a fish on then i'm gonna tell my scratch off story here in a minute i got a good scratch off story y'all come here fish bambi swam across the river i thought that was a deer bambi swam across and it's now can't climb that bluff wall, I guess. We're gonna get a good look at Bambi in a minute. Give me a jig back, fish. There we go. Get out of here. People don't wanna see you fish, they wanna see this deer over here. It's a little baby deer. He swam over to the bluff. That was dumb, deer. You ain't very bright swimming to the bluff wall that you can't climb up out of. That deer's so dumb, he'll be one that walks out in front of an oncoming car at some point in his life, I guarantee it. I guarantee it. I'm still upset with your kinfolk deer over wrecking my car a couple years back. That deer don't care. Deer don't like people, that's why they try to purposely wreck their vehicles by kamikaze themselves out in front of them. Are you just sitting there looking? No. Ain't nowhere he can run. He can't go up. 
You're lucky, dear. We got all these overhanging trees. I don't know if I'm gonna be able to get too much closer back under there. I am gonna try to make some cast over there though, because we've got two fish here in a row. Well, I don't know if it was in a row or not. I wasn't paying attention to my casting, but you know what I'm trying to say. Two fish close, close together here. I gotta oil these pliers. Come here, fan. Give me a thing back. If you smaller bluegill are going to eat these jigs, I'm going to need you to eat them in such a way that I don't have to go in and get it. There you go. Get out of here. I'll forgive you. I'm happy to catch you. Oh, look up here, y'all. We're about to get our we're about to get our trolling rods hung here. Make some cast over here at this area, though. Watch me catch a fish, Bambi. I got a live audience here with this deer. Apparently, they got a live audience. The geese behind me, they don't want me forgetting about them either. There's geese all over out here. I thought they had went farther in front of us. There's some bluegill right here in this little this little pocket, though. I'm gonna keep I'm gonna keep throwing in there. I know that's two in a row for sure. Old fishing Key Largo, he keeps track of our stats on these ultralight videos. He normally tells us how many casts I made, how many fish I catch, variety of species and whatnot. Where are you going, dear? I guess he's gonna come over here and try to help me reel one in. Listen, dear, I know you're scared, but I'm on some fish and I ain't gonna, oh, I had one hit me then. I ain't going, I ain't ready to leave yet, dear. You just calm your hind end down. I ain't gonna hurt you unless you step out in front of my car. Here's three in a row, by the way. I had to let that sink down quite a bit. If you step out in front of my car, ain't nothing I can do. Except lay on the brakes. But there ain't never enough time to do that. My new car, well, I'll, new car, I've had it a couple of years now since I I hit that fish's cousin. I put them deer whistle things on it. They basically glue on your grill there in front, and when you drive down the road, they whistle. You can't hear it, humans can't hear it, but allegedly there's a frequency that deer can hear. Here's, oh, I had another one. And apparently keeps them away, supposedly. I don't know if it does or not, but I ain't hit another deer since, so I'll give them credit for it, I guess. He's tired of watching this show. Now we got an Osprey up here. He had some claws full of something. I don't know if he's got a fish or if he's got nesting material. I guess we're breaking our streak. I'm distracted every which way. Here goes Bambi. Bambi's going to fall. Bambi, you better be careful. That's a long fall. Bambi made it up. Bambi's got a little mountain goat in his jeans. Be able to climb the side of a cliff like that. We'll see you next time, Bambi. Thanks for stopping by. I thought that was a deer earlier we saw. I thought it was. Just never know what you're gonna see on the Kayak Catfish channel, folks. Channel cat appearances, deer, ospreys, geese. You just never know. Might even see a bass fisherman out here today. Honestly surprised we ain't seen them yet. A Saturday in April, there's tournaments about every ramp. There ain't a tournament back here where I put in at, in this creek, but there's a bunch of people back there. Anyway, let me tell you the scratch off story. This is my big win, y'all. This is big gambling win right here. So, Get home from Vegas there. I'll tell you some more. I got plenty more Vegas stories too, by the way. We ain't done with them. But uh, 
I, I, hell, I may, these Vegas stories may spill over to another video, too. But anyway, get home from Vegas there and uh, Easter. When was Easter? Was it last weekend or weekend before? Days run together. Anyway, e we had Easter. It was in, Easter was in March this year. And every year, my mom gets me a little something. I know I'm 42 years old. I'm way too old for the Easter Bunny to be coming, but you know what? My mama loves me. And so every year she gets me a little something on Easter, a little Easter present. So this year she got some scratch off tickets for me. She got me and the girlfriend 10 scratch off tickets. So $2, $2 each tickets. We each got 10 of them scratch off. And so me and a girlfriend, we, we scratch off these tickets. There's the, oh, I had one. Uh, but anyway, we scratch off these tickets there, our Easter presents. And I won a few dollars on mine. And I think she hit for a couple free tickets or something on her, <clears throat> her set of scratch off tickets. But there's another one. I can catch up with him. He's coming right at me. Well, there's a bunch of bluegill over here in this little, this little pocket. This bluff wall just cuts in right here. And there's some broken off pieces of rock right there. And I guess some bluegill just all over it. <clears throat> I'm getting choked up, bluegill. I got sinus drainage here. I'm on the allergy meds, but it's pollen season. But um, anyway... Basically, both of us hit these scratch off my mom got us for a few dollars. But here's the thing we had a stack of scratch off tickets from Christmas still on my kitchen counter because my mom had also got us some scratch offs as like stocking stuff for presents at Christmas. And we had hit for a little bit on those as well. But here's the thing. To cash in a scratch-off ticket, that requires you to go in a gas station, which I hate doing. It requires you to talk to an actual human being. Also, I hate doing. So I have held off. Let's reel in another one. I have held off on scratch or turning in them scratch offs because I don't want to go, oh, this is a better one, because I don't want to go inside a gas station and I don't want to talk to anybody. This fish here, he says he don't like going into gas station either. He he pays at the pump, unless it's at Bucky's. I don't mind going in at Bucky's really because usually that's like an event. Bucky's is like a the Bucky's has got everything going on. I mean, it's a restaurant, grocery store, convenience store. There's a million bathrooms in there. I like going to Bucky's, but anyway, normal gas station. Forget about it. I don't go in. So we got all these scratch-off tickets, a pile of them there, that were stocking stuff for presents at Christmas. And so now we got our Easter ones. We got to add to. So we got a stack of these tickets. So we need to cash in. And so we were, me and her, we were going out to eat that night. We we're gonna go up to the Longhorn and get a steak. And we decided we would just go ahead and stop off at a gas station and cash them things in. So we go inside the gas station and there's this guy working there. And he looks like something out of the eighties, man. Motley Cruz behind the counter. He's got long hair, another fit. Oh. He spit it. This dude's got long hair, and for some reason, he's wearing a toboggan. Now, it ain't cold in the store. It's inside. It's probably, I don't know, 70-something degrees in there. It's comfortable in the store, but he's wearing a toboggan for some reason. But he's got long hair, and, you know, he, he's ready to go right from the gas station to the rock concert later that night, probably. So he sees us. Got hold of that one. He sees us with this handful of tickets, man. And he 
he ain't about it, buddy. He's upset with us. You could just tell by his demeanor. Like he does not want to be interacting with us no more than we want to be interacting with him. But we've got a transaction to do, so we both got to suck it up and get it done. So he takes this stack of tickets and he starts scratching them off because apparently when you turn in a scratch off ticket, there is a barcode on the bottom of it that's also covered in whatever that stuff is. So it has to be scratched off too. Well, I don't ever play scratch off tickets. I don't know how this stuff works. So none of those barcodes are scratched off and he needs that to be able to scan them on the machine to see what they're worth. So he's sitting there and man, he's taking his sweet ass time scratching them things off. Well, meanwhile, the line behind us is forming, man. People are stacking up. All everybody that goes to the gas stations, they get their beer and their cigarettes because that's the only reason people go inside of the gas station. They got their, their smokes and their six packs and man, we're holding them up from whatever they got going on that particular night. So I can tell the people behind us are frustrated with both us for being there and for Motley Crue for taking a sweet ass time. I can just, I can feel it, man. I ain't looking at them because I don't know what I'm supposed to do in that situation, honestly. Do you turn around and apologize to everybody? Do you just remain facing forward? Don't make eye contact? Like, what is the proper protocol? I don't know. So I just remained facing forward, no eye contact, just, but I could feel it, man. You could just feel the tension. Anyway, Motley Crue here, he finally, he finally finishes scratching off all the barcodes, scans our tickets, and everything combined with our Christmas tickets and our Easter basket winnings there, everything combined added up to like $63. And so, Here's what we had decided to do. Cause again, we're, we're fresh off of our Las Vegas trip. We're understanding how the gambling game works. The longer you play, you're gonna lose. And that's the same thing. It ain't just with, with the slot machines. It's like that with scratch off tickets too. Fish, we're moving on from this little pocket here, but there's these fish all up and down through here apparently. It's a little bit better one here. Come up here, Bluegill. I'm right in the middle of a scratch-off story. This is my big win, fish. He wants to hear about it, but he says he's got to go. So anyway, we've got $63 of scratch-off credit, basically. We can cash in for money or we can get more tickets. And so what we decided to do is instead of getting, because the tickets my mom gets us are like $1 and $2 tickets usually. Like at Christmas time, there might be a $5 one in there or something like that, but they're the, the lower price tier of tickets. And after being out there in Las Vegas and both me and the girlfriend both getting to spin the wheel on the Wheel of Fortune slot machine and then quickly losing our money afterwards because we kept spinning, we realized the best thing to do is to play as little as possible because nobody's going to hit the jackpot. So you're better off going to, uh, in this situation for instance, instead of getting some more $1, $2 scratch off tickets as we reel in another fish, what we were going to do instead was whatever the money added up to, we were gonna just divide it in half and get the biggest, two of the biggest possible value tickets. That way, if we do hit for, you know, say double the value of the ticket, it's a big win versus getting a bunch of $1, $2 tickets and ultimately ending up losing more money than, because again, you do that long enough, you eventually go bust, just like on a slot machine. And I've seen this to be true. Like there's been YouTubers and stuff that have bought a whole roll. I think Mr. Beast done it actually, where they buy an entire roll of scratch off tickets and you end up, you have some tickets that hit and some of them will hit big, but you buy a whole roll and you end up losing. What is this behind us? It's an airplane. Hang on y'all, we got another pilot. 
bluegill that pilots interrupted your your starring moment there that's one of them planes right there that lands on water too i hope he ain't gonna practice his landing out here today but like i was saying i'm pretty sure mr beast has done a video on this where they buy an entire roll of scratch offs and you have a few big winners on there but over the course of the whole roll you lose money and if you kept doing that long enough you just lose everything so motley crew has determined that we have 63 dollars of total winnings we can do something with so we were going to divide that number in half so they have 30 dollars scratch off tickets so we got two of those one for me one for her and we had that other three dollars so we just got a three dollar scratch off for it so we leave motley crew and the line of people behind us and it was four or five deep at that point by the time we finally got out of there so we go out to the car and we scratch off our 30 dollar scratch off ticket. this is the biggest scratch off ticket i've ever played folks you ain't gonna believe this but my ticket hit for $50 and hers hit for a free ticket, which is basically $30 that we got to work with. So now, and our $3 didn't mount nothing. So now we've went from free gifts, basically, from my mother to $63 with the Easter and Christmas tickets. Now we've turned that into $80. So, we had already had the conversation about like what we were going to do if we hit. We were just going to try to get a couple larger tickets and whatever we got, we were going to cash out. Because again, the longer you play, you're going to lose. But I mean, we've just hit for 80 bucks here. We've got another fish. Man, these blue, they're all over this bluff wall, man. And they're everywhere right through here. And the quality of the bluegill is getting better. It was small ones over there in that little pocket, but the, the ones on just the bluff wall, you can see these rocks. I mean, they just come straight down. These quality here are a little, a little bit better. Nice, bluegill. So, you know, we'd already had the discussion. Like, if we hit on these $30 tickets... Oh, my gosh. Are you serious right now? I just went to rare back to cast and i've hit this tree and wrapped my jig around the damn branch are you kidding me right now how do i do this how do not only how do i do that how do i do this on video this right here folks this is the problem with unedited raw and uncut videos you see me make a fool of myself i literally reared back to cast and i hit this damn tree I'm trying real hard not to break us off right now. I'm trying to pull myself closer to it. I can break off the branch. Oh, now I'm in another branch. How do I do this stuff, folks? I've been fishing. I've been fishing more years than years I ain't been fishing, and I still make a fool of myself every time the damn camera's going. I wrapped that thing around good too. Hold on a minute. Let me pause the story a second here. I'm gonna have to concentrate on getting this thing unwrapped here. I wrapped it around so many times, I don't know. Good gosh. Okay. Fill my line there, make sure I didn't. I think it still feels okay. Got leaves all over us. Y'all, be more careful next time. Don't don't cast in trees like that. You're interrupting progress here. I tried to tell you to watch out for that tree. And you put your bait right in it. Anyway, so we got eighty dollars in value in these tickets, but we had discussed that we were just gonna hit them and walk away, whatever we got. But when you get that big win and that's what these lotteries that's what they're counting on you get that win you just you get to urge like man i gotta i'm running hot right now i gotta get another ticket so we talked about it and we're like well 
eighty dollars that's basically two meals at longhorn like our bill at longhorn is normally forty dollars or something so we can go to longhorn twice or we can get us some more lottery tickets so we talked about it and man you gotta oh man you gotta let it ride right look like, so we we got these tickets so we're like we don't want to go back in here to motley crew because he's you know, he, he, Brett Michaels in there, he's already upset with us and whatnot. So we get on the interstate, we get off the exit there to go to Longhorn and there's another gas station, of course. So we pull in there. We're going to hit a different gas station. And we go inside and there's a woman at the counter and this woman, she's out of her gourd, man. Like she's, she's on something. Like she, she can barely keep her eyes open. But we hand her our two winning tickets. And again, we had forgotten to scratch off the barcode area. So this woman starts scratching them off and she's got these nails. She's literally doing it with her fingernail, y'all. She's got these nails. They come about two inches off her fingertips and they curl. I mean, they're the nastiest damn things. I'm, I'm sitting here watching her do that. And I don't want to watch, but I can't not look her just scratching it. and it's like slow motion because she's moving in slow motion because she's high as a kite there's a fish and i'm thinking the whole time like how does this woman because you know she's not cultured like me she doesn't have a bidet at her house like she's wiping her hind end the toilet paper still like a neanderthal how does she do that how does she wipe her ass with them long fingernails like how i don't even know i'm like i i don't know how she functions the only thing I can figure them long fingernails are good for is scratching off the the barcodes on the scratch off tickets, which they do a lot of that at gas stations, I'm sure. So maybe it's just a one of them things she's done for the job. That's probably got her employee of the month. I bet you if you walk back there toward the bathrooms, there was probably a picture up back there for her being March employee of the month or something. But anyway, she's scratching them damn barcodes off and we got $80 there to work with. And so I was like, my ticket had hit. There's another one. Man, there's, man, these bluegills are all over right there. Here. This is what I was wanting to have happen today, y'all. I was wanting to get on a bunch of fish today. This boosts your confidence. Oh, he broke me off. I bet our line was weak after that tree branch fiasco where y'all got your jig hung in a tree. Well, crap. Well, let me tie another jig on while I finish my story about the nails woman here. So, we we got this woman, and you know she got she tells us we got eighty dollars there, and so I was I was like I already told the girlfriend like look if we're if we're doing this let's go big. So my ticket, my thirty dollar ticket there from before had hit for fifty dollars, and hers had hit for the free ticket, which was basically thirty dollars there. And so I was like, I'm going to get a $50 ticket with mine. And so I did. I got a $50 ticket and the girlfriend got another uh, $30 ticket. And so we go out to the car and we scratch them things off. And, and there's no way in hell y'all going to believe this. I know you're not because people, this don't happen on scratch off tickets. But would you believe we both hit again? My $50 ticket hit for a hundred bucks. And her $30 ticket hit for a hundred bucks. So now, again, just to recap, we got these free tickets for stock and stuffers and Easter basket things from my mom. So we've turned basically no money out of our own pockets into $63, which we then turned into $80, which now we've turned into $200. And I'm like, man, we need to go back in there and get us four more fifty dollar tickets like we need to go in there. we got we're on a heater now like we got to let it ride and she's you know the girl she's a lot more responsible than i am she's like no no we gotta cash out like this is what we said was going to happen like we're, if we hit we're going to get excited we're going to think we're about to win more and we're going to get more tickets and we're ultimately going to lose the whole strategy was try to play bigger tickets hit for a little bit and then cash out so she's the voice of reason and I'm the degenerate gambler at this point. So we call my mom 
tell her the excitement. Because two, here's the other thing. I've never hit no scratch off tickets for something jumped right there. Did you see that? Was that on camera? I don't know if the angle was right. Something just come up and jumped right there, flipped us off. That fish wanted to be on camera so bad, they're tired of me waiting. Tired of waiting on me to get this jig tied on. But I call my mom and tell her the excitement. I'm like, can you even cash in? Like if we wanted to cash out, is that possible at a gas station? Because I I've heard like if you hit the lottery or a scratch off for a big prize, you gotta go to Nashville to some lottery office or something to cash it in. Like gas stations won't pay you out for a big amount. And I've never hit anything like this before. I don't I don't think I've ever you know, my mom gets these scratch offs about every year for stocking stuffers and stuff, and I don't think I've ever hit one for more than ten or twenty dollars maybe at the most. And I've never cashed out at a gas like I always just get more tickets until I eventually just end up losing everything. There's another one, man. This is pulling like a dickens too. We're getting on some little better quality bluegill over here as we've made our way along this bluff wall. Listen, here's a little bit. I brought a measuring board, but I don't think any of these have been really worth measuring at this point. They've been decent quality. This and here's probably, I'm guessing seven inches maybe. I think my measuring board starts at eight, so we'll just... Yeah, he's shy of eight inches there. He's probably seven, seven and a half inches. That's still, man, public water. That's a nice bluegill. It's a good time on my setup here. So, you know, we call my mom. We're excited, and she kind of explains that, yeah, gas stations can cash in that amount if we want to do it. And my mom's like, you need to cash in. Take the money. You're going to lose. So I got two voices of reason in my head, but I'm still on a heater though. Like I'm like, I gotta let it ride, man. It's like when you at the crap stable and you throw in the dice and you just gotta let it ride, man. So we had gotten out that night to, to go eat, right? I mean, that was the whole purpose of leaving the house to go out and to the world of other human beings was to go have somebody else prepare a meal for us. And so we were like, well, let's just go into Longhorn. We'll eat and we'll talk about it and we'll think it over. So over the course of dinner, the excitement of scratching off and hitting big kind of started to wane a little bit. Rational minds started to prevail. And so we left Longhorn and we ended up deciding we was gonna go and cash out our winnings. So we did. Uh, we went to a different gas station, hit three gas stations that night. That's the most gas stations I've been in at in years. I never go in. I always pay at the pump unless I'm on a road trip and I got to pee or something. And then I try to just make sure I'm stopping at Bucky's. I never go in, but we went to three gas stations that night. And we end up cashing in our, our tickets. So we each took a hundred dollar bill home with us that night. There's another one that's fired up at it, buddy. I'm just throwing that jig out and just letting it sink and they're whacking it. That's another thick one right here, man. It's another one I don't, he ain't very long. But look at the belly on them things, man. Look at that. Probably getting ready to, probably getting ready to spawn here at some point here soon. Let's just throw him on the board, he'll be, yeah. He's probably in that seven and a half inch range there too or so, but I mean, just a uh, thick for its size. I mean, he's got some shoulders on it there. Folks, this excites me. Look, I know y'all, many of y'all out there, you gave up bluegill fishing when you were kids. I get it. You know, they're, they're just, they've got that, that reputation there being a kid's fish, but I love it. I love doing this. This is fun. When you're getting, when you've been getting just beaten down on the catfishing trips like I have been, like either getting skunked 
or just getting one or two small fish like nothing i'm doing is going right it is so nice to come out here and have a day like today where i'm just going fishing man just throwing it random stuff down through here and getting bit like that's fun this brings you back to because let me tell you i don't mind getting skunk catfishing occasionally like it happens i don't care how good a fisherman you are everybody gets skunked no none of these tournament guys will admit it none of the youtube people are going to admit it but they will they everybody gets skunked from time to time it happens and i don't really mind it per se as long as it ain't in a tournament or something but when you when you go for a long stretch of time where you just can't get nothing going it kind of begets where it ain't much fun to go anymore because your confidence is so beaten down you're like why am i leaving why am i leaving the house to go fishing today i ain't gonna catch nothing it breaks your confidence so having a day like today come out here and kind of tear up some fish you know it, it it's good for the soul people it's good for the soul Got another one right here i'm just gonna keep i'm gonna set set here and keep catching them by gosh they keep it's almost like they keep getting a little bigger too because there's another one that's pretty good size you know you get a pond a managed pond or you go somewhere i mean there's some lake you know down there in lake ida in florida for instance i go down there well my pliers are plumb locked up i got wd-40 these things today when i get home um you go down there where they got them copper nose bluegill you can catch you some big bluegill there on, on the public water but here at home you get bluegill seven eight inch range like that's a pretty good bluegill i'm on fort loudon reservoir today but um, the one of the other local places near my house is called melton hill and the bluegill there tend to be a little bigger on average it seems like you get some more throughout the year there i'll get some bluegill in that nine inch range but the the 10 inch bluegill though that's I ain't caught one of them on public water in years. It's been a while. You gotta, I think to get a 10 inch bluegill on, on my waters here anyway. Now some public water, like you go up there in Minnesota, for instance, um, I don't go to Minnesota fish, but I mean, I've seen like in fishermen TV shows and whatnot. Some of those lakes, you know, they're, they're, some, they're more, some of those, especially smaller lakes are kind of more like ponds in my opinion. But some of those, some bodies of water, you just have the perfect conditions or whatever to grow a larger population of big bluegill. I think out here, in order to, one, I don't think there are as many here, probably, because of a lot of the predator fish i mean we've got bluegill being one of the bottom of the food chain we've got not only your catfish species and bass species but we've got striped bass in here um stuff like that so there's just a lot more predator fish that's going to be eating these so that's part of the other thing too and this probably affects me more than anything is i'd say a lot of the bigger bluegill probably are like most species of fish and that they spend a big portion of their life out in deeper water and i don't do that ultralight fishing when i'm coming out here i just i just want to go out and have fun i just want to come out here beat the banks catch whatever i catch so i probably just don't put my baits in front of big bluegill like i would if maybe i was say if i was using electronics and getting up on these humps out here in the middle of the river and places like that or getting out on deep points and, and kind of looking for those bigger bluegill and, and stuff like that maybe you'd catch more doing that but i just don't i don't want to fish that way honestly if i if i'm going to get out there 
in the deeper water and do that. I want to fish for catfish or something like that. You know, bigger. If I'm going to do that kind of fishing, I want to be targeting larger catfish, I guess is what I'm saying. Usually when I go ultralight fishing, I'm trying to hide from people, man. I'm getting back in creeks. I'm just beating the banks. Today I'm out here in the main channel. But I'm out here in the main channel because I know all the bass fishermen are in the creeks today. Because <laughs> there was a bunch of them in the creek I launched in. So I knew the main channel would be the place to be to avoid the most number of people. And I was worried I was going to be avoiding some fish out here too, but clearly we're on them. Yeah, this is this is what I like to do, man. I, I like to come out. And I've got a graph in that hatch right there. Now my old my old brain marine graph, just the basic graph tells me depth and speed basically. I had put it back in the kayak here with a small battery. That way when I'm catfishing in this kayak I can monitor my depth because I'd taken this kayak out on a trip recently that you didn't see because I was using a launch site that didn't have a, a boat ramp and I need to drag the kayak a little ways. And my other kayak's so dang heavy with the motor and live scope and batteries and all that. I just can't, I can't bring myself to drag that kayak any length of time. You're begging for a hernia or a back injury to try to do it. But this one, I can, I can launch this kayak pretty much anywhere. You take the pedal drive out of this thing and it's, it's lightweight. So anyway, I had put that graph back in this kayak for that day because I was going catfishing in this kayak. And so it's still in there, but I just don't, I don't feel compelled to use it because what would I be looking at on that graph right now? It would tell me depth, water temperature, speed. None of that crap really matters for what we're doing because I'm just throwing at the bank. Water temperature, I mean, is it interesting to know? I assume it's around 60 degrees right now. whoop de doo though. It's, fish are either here or they ain't. So we're getting bit, so we're kind of slowing down, taking our time working through here. If we wasn't getting bit, well, guess what? We'd move a little quicker until we did start getting bit. So I don't really worry about that kind of stuff. I think I, I, I almost think... I get bogged down with it. I waste too much time thinking about it in my other kayak because, you know, I got the live scope on there and I can look forward and shine it around and look at things. And it's helpful. It's helpful if you get on some, let's say you get on some crappie. That is helpful. Like for instance, here's a, here's something y'all haven't seen on video yet. I went out so here's what happened. I went out and bought me a really long crappie rod. This thing's half a mile long. But I did that for a reason. So I was on a bait run. I guess it's last week. Man, this thing is, this one's a strong one here, buddy. This one's a, I think this one right here is the biggest one so far today, y'all. This one here, we'll throw on the board. This is a good one right here, man. Look at this thing. This one, these dang hand-sized ones right here. Look at that, y'all. That's a nice bluegill. Let's throw you on the board, bluegill. Let me wet that thing. No, don't you do it, Boogie. I don't want to just throw you on the board a second. One second, Boogie. One, give me one second of your time, sir. Please and thank you. I'm not trying to sell you anything, Bluegill. I just want to, I just want to put you on board. You lay right there and be good. Flare your fin out if you want to. That's fine. Yeah, that one there, folks. That's a nice one. He'll touch eight and a quarter, almost eight and a half. He, he's a just a hair away from hitting eight and a half. Nice. Look at that, man. That's awesome, y'all. That, make, that makes a boy happy right there. That makes me happy. Get back up. I want to I wanna hit this area here real good. 
because there seems to be, we were in that little pocket up there and they were getting them small bluegill, we were getting a bunch of them, but right in here, and this, I mean, I assume, just from looking at it coming straight down, like it's gotta just fall straight off in the deeper water. But, but there, I mean, there's a bunch of bluegill right out from this outcrop or this wall here. And they seem to be a lot better quality than what we were getting up there in that pocket too. So anyway, um, I go and I buy one of these long crappie rods because I was out on a bait run recently and I wasn't doing any good on skipjack. The weather was terrible. I just went out to try to get some bait and I couldn't get any skipjack. I was in my other kayak with a live scope. I couldn't even find any shad to throw on. Like I was struggling, man. It was just one of them days. And I started scanning some brush because I had my ultralight rod with me too, but I couldn't, I couldn't go ultralight fishing. Really, like, because the wind was so bad that day. Like, I mean, it was just cranking that day, but I found some fish on some brush. And I ended up sitting there and I, I got some crappie and bluegill and enough to go out and do some catfishing with. But it wasn't, a, I mean, it wasn't a pleasurable experience by any stretch because it was just, the wind would just take your line as soon as you would cast. I mean, it was awful. But I was sitting there thinking, I'm like, you know, I see these crappie fishermen. Most of them, when they're live scoping, so we got another fish right here. They're using longer rods. I actually talked to a crappie guide recently ran into him on the water he waved at me on the water and we got back to the launch at around the same time and he come up and talked to me he he watched my channel knew who i was a real nice guy and uh which is surprising because most of these crappie fishermen hate my guts because i use their their precious fish for bait oftentimes but anyway this one liked me and he was super nice and um uh, like I said, he was a guide and he's got a boat rigged up for live scoping and all that. And so I was sitting there just pestering him with questions. I mean, if I meet somebody that is doing something or knowledgeable on something that I'm interested in, I'm on, I'm like a damn FBI interrogator, man. I got the spotlight on him. Like I'm just grilling this. And he thought he was just going to come up and shake my hand and tell me he liked my videos and I've got him out there for 20 minutes just pestering him with one question after another you know I'm getting me an education on that live scope so he was talking about you know when he got started learning live scope that he was kind of struggling with it too which live scope for me has been uh, I've had mine what two years now almost two years and it's been I've had some good times and a lot of bad times with it. like I'm not I'm not, I'm not good with it. Well, let's just point it out, point it out how it is. Like I'm still, everybody thinks, everybody on the internet, you read these posts and stuff, everybody thinks you just turn on live scope and you just catch big fish. And I'm convinced all the people saying that on social media don't actually have live scope. Because I don't just turn it on and go catch big fish. Like you don't. It just ain't like that. So anyway, this crappie guy, he was like, you know, when I started, I got frustrated with it. So I basically, he, he said he took all the rods out of his boat, except for one. And he spent two weeks, every trip he went out for two weeks, he had his live scope and he had one 16 foot rod and a jig. And that's how he taught himself to work that live scope. He just forced himself to fish with that one rod and the live scope and make it work. And so he's figured out how to do it now. And now he's going out there and and he said, here's what he said he done. This is how he, he's back there fishing. He was working, I had seen him in a creek one day and he, I'd went out of the creek and he had went back into the shallows. And what he was doing was he said he'll set his distance on the live scope to where he's looking out 60 feet. He puts his depth at 15 feet. He looks forward 60 feet. 
and when he spots a fish out at the at the distance he will creep up to it and once he gets close enough he will adjust his screen so that he's only looking 20 feet out that makes everything look bigger on the screen and then he will reach out with one of those long poles and again he said 16 foot's his favorite length he'll drop that jig down in their face so i had had that conversation with him there recently and then I'm out there on the water there on that bait run and the wind's just cranking and man, I can't hardly cast. And, you know, I'm seeing fish that are like down in brush and stuff. And there was one, there was also two, I had come up on a dock that was stacked with fish, but there was this metal beam going across and I couldn't cast under the beam because there was something under there. And if I cast it over the beam, a fish hit, it run you across the metal, cut your line off. So I was kind of, those fish were kind of just, they were just off limits to me basically with my current setup. But I was thinking the whole time, I'm like, man, if I had me one of them long rods right now, I'd reach over that metal bar and just yank them fish up or like that brush that those fish were down in that I couldn't really let them run down and reel them out. Like if I could just reach down behind that branch or whatever and pull them straight up, like I could, the wind wouldn't even affect me in that situation. See, so anyway, armed with all of that, I was like, I'm gonna go get me one of them rods. It's about a half mile long. So I ended up, I was like, you know, I don't want to just start out with a 16 foot rod. That's too, that's too much too soon, especially in a kite. So I went to the local tackle shop over here, Big Fish Outfitters, and I got me a 10 foot model which is still way longer than this it'll allow me to kind of reach a little bit because the handle the reel is like right here on the handle so you get the full 10 foot length of it so with my arms reaching out over something i've got like about 12 foot of length or so give or take and so i get me one of them raw and, and it's a acc crappie stick rod i think it's called I don't know anything about the company or brand. It's the only, you know, I went in there, Big Fish Outfitters, and I was like, look, I need me a, a crappie rod that's a half mile long to put a jig on. And that's the only brand they had, so that's what I got. $90, by the way, too. Highway robbery for that damn rod. But anyway, I got me one. And so I went out, I can't remember what day it was now. It was recently. My days have run together, y'all. It was recently I went out. And what I thought I would do would be to film, do an unedited video with me using this long rod because I've never used a rod like that before. And I thought, you know, this might be educational for somebody. There might be somebody out there watching an internet land that might be interested in watching me learn something new. Because oftentimes you, you turn on YouTube and you're watching somebody like me who was fishing long before I ever started YouTube. You see, I don't want to say the finished product because I'm always learning and getting better at whatever it is I'm doing, but you see a more experienced person in me on YouTube than what I was 20 years ago. I mean, if you saw me 20 years ago trying to catch a fish, it would look much different than it looks now because I didn't have the knowledge and experience then is what I do now. So I thought it might be interesting to go out with the live scope and a long rod and film it and let you see, watch me learn, watch me fail and figure things out. And that was another one of them days where I, I go out and thinking I've got a window of time to fish and mother nature says, ha ha, Justin, that's what you get for thinking. I'm on the water an hour, monsoon, man. The skies open up and I knew there was a chance of showers that day. But like, I mean, it, I mean, it was a damn monsoon, like to the point, like there wasn't no, there wasn't gonna be no filming nothing like that and i'd even jimmy rigged me a new mount 
for that situation, like where I could film the live scope screen and film from my chest at the same time. It was gonna be an editing nightmare to put it all together, but I was gonna to try to have that screen like in the corner of your video at all the time and just go out there unedited. So for two, three, four hours I was on the water practicing with that long pole, you was gonna see everything that I was seeing on the live scope screen and watch me make a fool of myself learning how to use this long rod. But again, mother nature, hour into it just opened up the skies i mean just a monsoon like heavy downpour and i was like this sucks man i was drenched and so i just i turned the camera off i put them up and it's like we're going to live to fight another day <laughs> you know? but fishing with the long rod i did catch some fish doing it uh, just dropping baits down to crappie, individual crappie, on brush piles. Uh, it was effective. It wasn't, there's another bluegill. It wasn't as cumbersome as what I thought it would be. As I was worried, this is why I didn't want to get a 16-foot rod to start out with. I was worried with me sitting down in the kayak, I was worried that it would just be too much. And so, uh, I, I, you know, I just didn't know. I've never done it before. I didn't know what to expect, but I thought it might be just too much rod. You'd be hung in everything. Like what happens, what happens if you're sitting in a kayak and you've got a 12, 14, 16 foot long rod and you break off? How do you get down, like let's say you break off and your line falls down through your guides. How do you get down to the end of the rod to be able to thread your line back through? I mean, is your reel, is it three feet down in the water while you do it? Like how do you do that sitting down in a kayak? So I went with the 10 foot, you know, and it, it surprisingly just wasn't that cumbersome. Um, you know, and, and, and I was out there and it was lightweight. That's another thing too. I was worried just, just, I, I don't know if you call it fatigue, but just over the course of a few hours fishing with a rod that's that long, like, is it going to be comfortable to use? And I forget the weight on the one I got. I think it's like four point something ounces, I think. I mean, it's pretty lightweight, and obviously the longer the longer the rod you get, the heavier it's going to be. So, I, you know, I, did, I wasn't sure about that, but it, it was, for the short time I used it, uh, it was fairly comfortable to use. And now these rods, here's one thing that was different. Obviously, out here today, I'm using an ultralight rod. And I use this rod even if I'm catching crappie or whatever you know uh, uh, that, that's what i like to use but the long rod i got is a medium action so it's a heavier action and i guess it kind of has to be because you're you're, you're kind of lifting those fish up you need to get control of them a little more if you're pulling them out of brush or something like that so but it was still, I mean, the crappie I caught, I didn't catch any big ones. I got like, I think the biggest one I got was like 11 inches. But I mean, they were enjoyable to catch with it. But I mean, it's not going to be a thing like we're out here today, for instance. And I don't know how many fish I've caught so far. I'm sure fish in Key Largo will tell us, but it's been a lot. Uh, I was not going to have that kind of day fishing with that long rod that day i mean i guess maybe if conditions were ideal maybe you could but like me just going brush pile to brush pile and taking my time looking around with that live scope and trying to get a fish i guess i guess if i was fishing open water like that that day i saw the guide out there who gave me all that information he was in the back of a creek but he was kind of like on a flat like a shallow flat he's in back there and fish were just up chasing bait and, and whatnot. And, and so 
I guess if you had a large number of fish in a situation like that, you could have a big day, numbers-wise, with one of those rods. But I wasn't going to start out. I knew me going out there my first few times trying to use this rod, like, I'm not going to have a day like that. Like, there's going to be... I'm going to be moving a lot slower than what somebody who is more experienced is going to be able to move. <clears throat> and the other thing, too, with doing that out of a kayak, one of the things I struggle with with live scope, and this has been true, too, when I have tried to live scope catfish with artificials, I struggle with boat control. You know, because kayaks are just so dang lightweight. Like right now, the wind's barely blowing. We got a little boat weight coming in, and I'm getting pushed up here on this, on this bluff wall. Like, you just get you get moved so much easier in a kayak than what you do a heavier boat. Like the lightest breeze blows you around in a kayak. So boat control being able to spot fish out at a distance, work your way up to them, keep everything perfect. You know, this is one of the advantages, and one of the things I think that crappie have kind of been dominated by live scope is the fact that they're oftentimes sitting still. When you see them sitting on brush, they're oftentimes just sitting there. Or they'll be stacked like on top of each other on a piece of brush or a log or something. Or you find them out in open water, they're literally, they'll just be sitting there just perfectly still out there in the water. Other fish species, they're moving. Like you see them on the screen, but they're on the move. And it's hard to, it's hard for me anyway, to follow those fish. A fish that's actively swimming. So, like I said, I spend a lot of time I've spent a lot of time with that live scope and I've had some good days with it but I mostly I'm mostly just annoyed with or frustrated by it because I don't feel like I'm getting the results that I should be getting with it and I see all that crap on the interweb man all these knuckleheads on there they're just like oh you just get a live scope just turn it on catch big fish like it just it just don't work like that that ain't how it goes like you gotta be shining that thing where there are some fish to even see them and sometimes just because you see fish don't mean you're going to get them to bite so when it comes to when it comes to fishing for things like like what i'm doing today out here just fun fishing man this is more enjoyable to me than to be out in my other kayak with the live scope and just looking down this yeah we might see some fish here on this bluff wall but i mean honestly i don't care i don't care to see them I, it seeing them seeing them eat your jig is exciting when you see them come up to your jig and thump it that's exciting but it's also exciting too doing what i'm doing today and having that anticipation, I guess is the right word, like not knowing what's there, what you're casting to, what's coming up on your bait. There's excitement with that too. It's a different kind of excitement, but it's enjoyable nonetheless. And that's one thing that live scope takes away. Like you either get one or the other, you don't get both. Like with live scope, you get the fun of seeing that fish come up and feeling that thump when they hit it that's exciting you don't get that with this but conversely you when you got live scope and you're seeing what's happening you don't really have that necessarily that anticipation of not knowing because you see before you cast are you casting to a fish because you see it there before you before you put your bait out so you know, it's kind of one or the other. There's not a wrong or a right. It really, I mean, it's personal preference. What do you, what do you like? I don't, it don't matter to me what you personally use. But most of the time when I'm going to go out and do this style of fishing, I would just rather do this right here with no electronics at all and just come out here and beat the banks, man. 
And if it's a day where, like, I need bait or something, and maybe I want some live crappie or whatever, take that long rod out there, half a mile long, and go see what I can find with it. So, you know, it's good to have options, but again, most of the time, like this right here is what I, what I really want to, to do when I go out, just a fun fish. I would like to use crappie for bait more often though, because I'm, I've about had it with these crappie fishermen, man. The, the guy there that I met at the boat ramp, his name was Caleb something. I've given credit. I mean, I would totally shout him out because he was a nice guy. I can't remember his last name though. I'm terrible with names. It was Caleb something. Um, but just super nice guy. He said he fishes all over here in East Tennessee. Watts Bar, Chickamauga, all of it. But um, he is not representative of most crappie fishermen's attitude toward me. Most of these guys hate my guts because I use crappie for bait. And I've never really understood their negative attitude toward me. It would be one thing, like... When I use a largemouth bass for bait and the bass fishermen blast me, I totally get it. I fully understand that because bass fishermen are mostly catch and release fishermen. Like all these tournament guys, they kill a bunch of fish in their tournaments, carrying them fish around in live wells, especially in the summer months. Like there's a high mortality rate. They kill a bunch of them, but their mentality is catch and release. So if I kill one of their bass to use for bait, I can understand their thought process of why they're upset with me. I get it. But crappie fishermen, on the other hand, I don't understand at all because they are not a catch and release mentality. In fact, most of the crappie fishermen that I interact with around here are catch and kill. Like they take everything. If it's a legal size, they take it home to eat it. They got their freezers full. They always brag how they got their limit today. They already got a freezer full at home. They don't know where they're going to put them. That's what crappie fishermen brag about. But yet, if I keep a crappie to use as bait, and, and how many, y'all that watch my channel regularly, honestly, how many crappie do you see me use over the course of a year? 15, maybe 20? I mean, I don't even keep a limit of crappie over the entire year. These guys that are out there crappie fishing regularly, they're keeping a limit of crappie every day they go out. Like they're killing a limit of crappie every time they hit the water. But yet, they get upset with me because I want to use one as bait. I should be eating that fish. Why? Why should I be? They got a whole freezer full of fish they're never going to eat. They're, they're more wasteful than I am. See, anyway, these crappie fishermen, they hate my guts, right? I'm about sick of them. I about had it with them. Because here's what happened. I got home from Las Vegas. I still got more Las Vegas stories, I got to tell you, too. These Las Vegas stories, it may be a two unedited video trip before y'all get all of them. But I get home from Las Vegas, and I've been off social media for that entire weekend. Like, I... I unplugged from social media, YouTube comment box, Facebook, Instagram. Like I didn't look at any of it while I was in Las Vegas. I was completely, I was completely ignorant to what was going on in the world. And I was better off for it too. Let me tell you, there's going to be some more breaks from social media in the future for me. It was, I was blissfully ignorant and blissful was the key word. There goes no one bass fisherman. So anyway, I get back home and I got to get back to the real world. I mean, I say I hate social media and I do as the geese are. They're playing king of the mountain or something up there. One's up on that rock and I guess some others want to be up there. And that one keeps pushing them back down. Remember that game you played as a kid? You'd be on a hill, king of the mountain. Somebody would be on top of a steep hill and they'd, you'd try to get up there and throw them off of it. Anyway, y'all don't care about that. 
So I've unplugged for social media for a few days while I'm out there in Las Vegas. I get home, I gotta get back to the grind because even though I may hate social media, I'm kind of dependent on it to keep the lights on through these YouTube videos and stuff. So I, I have to be engaged on social media even though I don't want to engage with people on social media. Most of y'all are great that watch these videos, but there's enough people out there that aren't that ruins it for, ruins the experience for everybody. So I get home and I'm getting caught up on YouTube comments and social media stuff. And somebody has tagged me in a Facebook video. And it's a video of mine. I wish them geese would go on. But it's a video of mine that's been stolen. And that's, that's, I've talked about that in other unedited videos and stuff. There's been, it's been rampant here really the last few months, last year. These people in foreign countries will steal your videos and sometimes they'll create these imposter pages that are made to look like you or, or me or other YouTubers, you know, to try to swindle people into giving them money and whatnot and other times they'll just steal your videos and post them on like random generic fishing pages that they've made just to try to get the ad revenue and that was the case with one of this so somebody from my audience had tagged me in this video on some random fishing page but they had stolen well they'd stolen several of my videos but this one in particular they tagged me in was a video where i had used crappie for bait and it's gotten a ton of views and it's got a, a list of comments down through there. And here I am, fresh off vacation, fully decompressed from social media, feeling good about life. What do I do? I click on the comment box. Big mistake, huge mistake. It's bad, it's hard enough to get motivated to click on my own comment box on my channel, but you definitely don't want to do it on other people's. So, here I go down through the comment box reading all these people that just blasted me, man, because I used a crappie for bait. Legal to do, totally legal here in Tennessee. I get it. It's not legal in every state. What do I care? I'm not fishing. I, com I comply with whatever laws of the state I'm fishing in at a given time. If I go to a state where a crappie's not allowed, well, guess what? I don't use crappie. I will comply by whatever laws are in existence. But here in Tennessee, it's legal. So if I have crappie and I want to use them, well, by damn, I'm going to use them. But these people are just thinking, man, they're in that comment box. They think I am the devil. I should just be burned at the stake, man. They're all just blasting me one after another after another. And I'm, you know, instantly just all of that peaceful bliss that I had achieved by not looking at any of that crap for days was gone in an instant. And when you get attacked, I think it's human nature, really. Your first instinct is to fight back, to just go after these people. But that's never the right idea because these people, let's face it, if they're all if they're on social media all day long and they're writing out these posts just essays just complaining and griping and talking bad about people they're losers they're losers at life they suck at life there's a reason why that they're doing that they're they're just miserable human beings that's why they're on there they ain't got shit else better to do than to just be on social media all day finding stuff to complain about. That ain't me. That ain't people that I associate with. So if you engage with those people on there, you're giving them what they want and what they need, which is attention. They're not getting, they, they obviously don't have people in their lives that are giving them attention. They don't. They clearly don't have healthy relationships at home or else they wouldn't feel compelled to spend all day doing this crap. So anyway, I fought the urge to get involved with those people on there. I filled out my copyright form for the stolen video, which 
I think Facebook got around a few days later to removing it and several others from that particular page that is, you know, just one of them random generic fishing pages. These people, India, Pakistan, wherever, in internet cafes, they just sit over there and steal people's videos all day. And they make a few bucks. It's a life-changing amount of money to them. So it's worth it to them to just steal videos and try to get ad revenue. And Lord knows there's no consequences for it. Even if Facebook or YouTube, whoever shuts them down, they'll just create a new account and be right back to it with the same videos the next day. So anyway, I've, I, I'm just, you know, I've read all of this damn comment box and which I shouldn't have done. I should have never went in there. I knew what was going to be before I ever clicked on it. And I'm pissed off, you know, I'm just, it's just human nature. When people attack you, you want to attack back. I, I held off the urge, but I'm like, you know what? Because in my mind, I'm thinking exactly what I just told you a little while ago. Like, yes, I will use crappie for bait, but it's not every trip. It's usually in the spring, honestly, late winter, early spring. That's when I do the best with crappie as bait. So that's typically when I use them. And I don't use, but maybe 15, 20 a year at the most. But I was like, you know what? If all these crappie fishermen... If they want to hate my guts, if they want to try to attack me, if they want to run my name through the mud all over the internet, how about I give them a damn reason to do so? Yeah, if, if any of y'all out there, I know most of you have, it was a great movie. You remember that movie though, The Patriot with Mel Gibson? I can't remember when it come out. I think it might've been the nineties, mid nineties, I guess. If you've been living under a rock and you've never seen The Patriot, or maybe you just got great taste in YouTube videos and you only watch Kayak Catfish YouTube videos, you don't watch anything else. If you've never seen The Patriot, it's a Mel Gibson movie, and the, the storyline of the movie is about the Revolutionary War. Benjamin Martin is who Mel Gibson plays in the movie. And the states are wanting to go to war with England for the independence of America. Benjamin Martin is against the idea of going to war because he knows the damage that it will cause. But ultimately he gets brought into the war because his son gets killed. So he gets, he's basically a, he's brought into it because of that. He becomes the leader of the militia. But there's a scene in the movie, The Patriot. And Mel Gibson goes to visit General Cornwallis, who was the leader of the Great Britain's army. And Mel Gibson went to meet, for him, meet with him for a prisoner exchange. And during this visit between the two, this interaction, General Cornwallis tries to lecture Mel Gibson about the conduct of a gentleman during war. Because Benjamin Martin, Mel Gibson's militia there was taking out officers, Great Britain's officers, who apparently back in those days were off limits. You were supposed to just attack the general soldier, not the officers. But Benjamin Martin was taking out all of them. So General Cornwallis starts to lecture him about how it's wrong to do that, it's, uh, conduct not becoming of a gentleman, blah, 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 blah. And so Benjamin Martin puts him in his place. Now he says, as long as your officers continue to kill women and children and burn down these towns, I will instruct my, my men to take out officers at the onset of every battle. And so he let General Cornwallis know, if you're gonna act that way, I'm going to act that way. And that's kind of where I'm at with these crappie fishermen. They want to hate my guts. Fine. I'm going to hate their guts too. They don't want me. They want to blast me all over the interweb for using bait. Fine. I'll take the advertisement from them. I'll just start using crappie on the regular. Even if I don't want to use crappie, if I catch them, I'll keep a few just because. 
that's how it's going to be folks if they want to be upset with me i'm going to start giving them some reasons to be upset with me i got no loyalty to these i like catching crappie but what difference does it make in my mind like if i release a crappie and i release most of them the guy coming behind me to crappie fishes is going to kill it anyway so what difference does it make if i if i keep a few extra for bait that fish had no chance regardless so that's how it's going to be going forward folks people want to be in a crappie world they want to hate me and they about to have some reasons to by gosh i just my man for the life of me like i don't understand all of this bitterness like this visceral reaction that's created by me using a crappie for bait like these people i mean they hate my guts about it like i just don't understand why they get so angry over it like how miserable and pathetic is your life that you just feel compelled to write out a damn essay about it like why are you on social media just complaining they don't know me you know hell we finally got a fish here no he lost it we've been through a dry spell on the fish i thought we had one there but like i just don't get it i i think we're just at that point in society there's no going back right like it's a different it's a different world now than what it was before social media and social media it, it has some positives to it right like i'm able to do what i'm doing today because of social media without it i wouldn't be able i mean i'd be out here fishing but i wouldn't be able to come out here and share these videos with you and have the community of people around me that i do and you know whatnot so it has its positivity it has some positive with it and initially when it started i think that was what it was intended to be for was sharing your life sharing your experiences especially with people that are great distances away for instance like you know before youtube took off for me i was working as a nurse i was a travel nurse i was doing the contracts and so i'd go somewhere and work and typically most travel nurse contracts usually 13 weeks and so i'd go work somewhere 13 weeks sometimes i'd extend and stay longer depending on if i liked it or if the facility had a need but either way within 13 26 weeks it's time for me to move on to the next place and while you're there you make friends co-workers you interact with people and you make some friends but once your contract ends like you're just you're probably not ever going to see them again not in person anyway and so that's where social media is kind of a good thing because you can kind of even though there's a distance between you you can kind of keep track and keep in touch with people that you've met and uh, at least had a you know friendship with there for a short period of time so it was great for that but somewhere along the way social media turned real negative it, everybody's sharing pictures of the good things in their lives the happy times kid pictures uh, in our case big fish catches major life events vacations people sharing all that and it makes a perception that people are just happy all the time and so that's not true nobody's happy all the time nobody just has a good day every day of the week like it, it's true of anybody okay nobody has a perfect life no matter how good it seems that somebody has it nobody's life is perfect but everybody's life looks perfect on social media so if you take somebody who is already maybe just a maybe they've got some insecurities or they're a jealous person by nature you take somebody like that 
who already has those tendencies or those whatever, you know, jealousy, uh, bitterness, maybe some anger issues, insecurity, whatever. You take somebody like that and you constantly expose them every day. Every time they open up their phone, they're seeing people just smiling, just smiling, having a great life, a great time. I think it increases whatever insecurity and jealousy issues they have, it just compounds it because they're being exposed to it all the time. They're like, man, everybody's living a better life than me. Why does my life suck? Here's a fish, finally. Boy, we had a long dry spell. And so the people who are insecure and angry become more insecure and angry. And it just, it leads them to attacking people online and then the people who start getting attacked online, I think maybe they start feeling a little insecure or angry. And then they start like, and it, and it just compounds. The negativity grows negativity and it just goes and goes and goes. And now we end up in a, in a time where we're at today where you, you can't go through social media without just seeing garbage on there. You know, I mean, it, it don't matter... How, you don't have to scroll down far through Facebook, Instagram, TikTok, YouTube. Like, you don't have to scroll far to be exposed to some kind of BS. Every day, no matter what, what, no matter what type of people is on your feed, no matter what genre of videos you watch, you're going to be exposed to some nonsense every day. Because that's where we're at with society now. That's just the way it is. And, you know, and maybe it's our own damn fault for only sharing the good things on social media. You know, everybody takes a picture of happy times when they're smiling, right? You don't, nobody's taking pictures, although now I take that back. I was going to say nobody takes a picture of themselves when they're, when they're angry or they're crying or something, but that's not true because now in this day and time where people are trying to get social media clicks by any means necessary, they're filming everything to try to do that. I mean, I've, you know, I guess because of my nursing background, if I get on TikTok, I see some nursing videos and stuff. And, and these nurses now, one of the popular things, is somebody dies, one of their patients dies, they'll bust out their phone and run out the room and film themselves crying about it. And I'm like, really? Is that where we're at? So I recant my previous statement of nobody filming themselves doing something other than being happy because that has changed. But that's changed recently. For the longest time, social media was just nothing but kid pictures and vacation pictures and all that. Nobody was posting that stuff. I mean, they'd take a picture, they'd fix a dinner, right? Like they'd have a nice meal prepared. They'd take a picture. You'd see everything on their plate on social media. That's what you'd see. That'd be their post for the day. They ain't gonna take a picture of the giant crap they took after eating that. Nobody wants, they, nobody wants to show you the bad stuff. They only want to show you the good stuff. And I think that's maybe led to where we're at with society now today. But social media now, man, it's just toxic. Like if I didn't have to do social media, for this YouTube channel and whatnot, I'd be completely off of it. I can't be completely off of it because even when I had tried to get off Facebook there before, people would contact me about Facebook because all those imposter accounts would be popping up. So like I have to have a presence on there so that I can keep the imposters away. So like I can't get off of it, but, but I mean, if I wasn't doing YouTube, I wouldn't be on social media at all. When I went out there to Las Vegas and just turned it off for a few days, like didn't didn't look at anything on my phone. It was nice, man. <laughs> it was and it was hard. Because I think I think we have gotten so what's the word I'm looking for? Like so just it's what we do. 
I mean, I, I, I'm there at the airport. Uh, we're riding somewhere in an Uber. We've ordered, we're at a table somewhere. We've ordered our dinner. We're sitting there like, it's just natural instinct. Grab our phone and scroll. It's what we do. And so I was fighting the urge, like we'd be out there and be in one of those situations. And I would catch myself, even though I'd made the decision beforehand that I wasn't gonna get on social media on vacation, I would find myself reaching for my phone just out of habit, not even thinking about it. Like I would have to think about it to stop myself from doing it. And uh, that's, that's a problem. Like, and if I'm like that, as much as I hate social media, if I'm like that, I think everybody's like that. It's all just ingrained in us now. It's become such a part of our lives. Like there's no going back. And, and, and here's something else. I, I was having a conversation about this recently, kind of on the same topic of this social media stuff. Let's take somebody, let's take somebody like, let's say Bill Dance. Most of y'all out there you watch my channel, you like catfishing or you like this style of fishing. But I mean, even if you're not into bass fishing, chances are, if you're watching my channel, you know of Bill Dance. Like we all grew up watching Bill Dance Saturday mornings, right? Like he was a big part of my childhood growing up. I mean, a big part of the reason why I got into fishing because his TV show was very enjoyable. I would, I would say a big reason why bass fishing is the number one type of fishing in the United States is probably largely in part to Bill Dance and his TV show, right? But Bill Dance grew up and was on TV during a different time, a different generation. And nowadays, like, I think Bill Dance has a YouTube channel. Uh, he's on social media some. And, and it's positive, I guess. I haven't read, I haven't clicked on his videos and went down to the comment box or anything. But like, when people, when random people nowadays talk about Bill Dance, it's all positive. Like it's, when you see Bill Dance pop up on something, for me, and I think most people, it's almost a nostalgic feeling. Like it kind of takes you back to your childhood. He's almost like that grandpa type figure nowadays where it reminds you of the good old days. And so even though he's on social media, like I don't think he is subjected to social media like modern day people are. And, and so here, here's where I was going with this. Here's where I was going with it. And this is a conversation I had recently. You take somebody like Bill Dance, who grew up in a different generation, different time, on social media now, but still just beloved. If Bill Dance was, and I don't know how old he is now, but let's say he was 25, 30 years old right now. And up and coming Bill Dance is doing the modern day route. You're going on YouTube, you're on TikTok. Uh, you're making your name, he's making his name for himself in today's time. Here's a fish. Got a long tree coming out right here. Well, I assume that tree comes out. Um, if he was coming up in today's time, if he's 25, 30 years old today, would he be the same guy and be as beloved 30 years from now as what he is in present day time. Because you see, back in Bill Dance's day, back in 70s, 80s, when he was on TV in the heyday there, the culture was different in this country. Like we were polite, we were respectful of each other. If somebody was on TV like Bill Dance, they were kind of revered, they were on a pedestal. And we looked up to people on the pedestal. But nowadays, there's really not a pedestal. Uh, even people like athletes, like professional athletes, movie stars, 
people that kind of have celebrity status, if you will, they're not really on a pedestal anymore. I mean, I think, I think society kind of, we lift them up to kind of put them on a pedestal, but we only do it so we can try to knock them off and tear them down. Like that's, that's how it is nowadays. Like it don't matter who you are. Jesus himself could descend from the heavens on a golden chariot to save humanity. And I promise you, man, somebody would be on social media complaining that, that the news cut in and, and interrupted their soap opera to cover the event or something like that. I mean, Jesus himself would be complained about on social media because that's the way it is today. And so I was having that conversation with a fellow recently. I'm like, if Bill Dance was 25, 30 years old in 2024, he's on YouTube, he's on TikTok, he's trying to, he's trying to make his name for himself in the fishing industry. Would he survive it? Would he, and I think, you know, would he make it? I think he would. Uh, the cream, uh, the, granted, there's more people on social media now than ever before. Everybody has a platform. Back in Bill Dance's day, you had to be, you had to know somebody to know somebody to get on a TV show, right? Now, anybody with a cell phone and internet connection has a platform. They have a voice. I got hit again right out here in front of the dang kayak, man. But even with the sat oversaturation, something stole my gulp. They ripped me off right there, man. That dang fish. Let's get us another gulp on there. But even with the, the just the oversaturation with everybody having a platform now, I do think Bill Dance would still be big. I, I, I think just his personality, his demeanor, the way he's able to talk and explain things, like, I think that he would succeed even in today's time if he was up and coming. But, and this, was, this is where I was going with this. I don't know, I don't believe 20 years from now, 30 years from now, Bill Dance would be looked at with reverence, I guess, if you will the same way that we look at him in today's time with his age and what, whatnot. Because again, just culture and society today, we complain about everything. We try to tear everybody down. And I think we would have, we would be tearing him down if he was up and coming today. And so I don't think, and who knows how he would respond to that, how he would handle that adversity. You know, that's another thing. It's like you, it changes you a little bit. You have to harden off to it. Here's a fish casting out deeper. I think that tree must run out farther. But I mean, it does change your attitude. You, you, you have to become a little bit hardened off. You have to become a little bit more defensive, I think, because of it. And with him never having to go through that back in the day. And here's the other thing back in those days only way the only thing we ever saw of somebody like, and I'm just saying I'm not calling Bill Dance out or anything listen I'm just using him as an example because he's a this is a fishing channel and he's a popular fisherman that everybody knows and I mean I again I love Bill Dance I was a huge fan as a kid he's a big reason that I got into fishing I mean really honestly so I'm not saying anything bad about Bill Dance at all here but in his day, there was no social media. People wasn't all up in your business 24 seven. Like he had privacy. The only time people saw him was on TV. Nowadays, if he was 25, 30 years old today, not only are people gonna watch his fishing show, wherever platform he was on, but man, they're gonna wanna know his personal life. Uh, they're going to be all up in his business. Where's he eating at? Where's he vacationing to? What are his other hobbies? Who does he hang out with? People are going to be 
telling lies about him and making up stories and bashing him and stuff and you know you know because that's just the way it is today how would he respond to that adversity you know you just don't know you don't know how you're going to respond and how you're going to be until you're in that situation and so i i i just i guess to sum it all up i think it's just a different time now it's a different culture and you know in bill dance's case i think he would be successful in today's time because of his personality and his demeanor and all of that but i don't think 30 years from now a bill dance growing up today would be looked at with the same reverence as what we look at bill dance at now having grown up with him in the 80s 90s etc that's a long-winded story to get to the punchline you know and that's all opinion you know who knows but i don't think we're ever going to have in today's society with social media i don't think we'll ever have another bill dance type person come along the only person maybe close to it right now is somebody like a richard gene the fishing machine i don't ever see anybody say anything bad about him kind of the same thing you know he's got a good personality everybody kind of looks at him as kind of like that grandpa figure he brings up a lot of nostalgic stuff with the way he fishes because he he fishes a very simple way most of the time but even though richard gene has been on youtube for just a few years he's still older he's still you look at him and you think of like that that grandpa type figure that takes you back to your childhood if Richard Jean right now was 25, 30 years old and starting out, would we look at him the same way? I don't know. I don't know. And that's where I, I guess I was going with all that. It's just a different time now. And I don't know the, the way we're doing things with social media. I don't know if it's a good thing for the longevity and the happiness of society. I don't know. I don't know. I, I, I just don't, I don't have the answers to it. But it's just, I mean, it's, you imagine back in the day, you take somebody like, because uh, I mean, we tear everybody. There's nobody safe anymore. Celebrities, actors, athletes, politicians, man, everybody's fair game nowadays. The bigger you are, the more targets you got on you. But you imagine somebody back in the day like a JFK, because wasn't it rumored now like jfk and marilyn monroe had something going on you know that was all hush hush quiet back in the day but you imagine some scandal like that in 2024 jfk and marilyn monroe holy cow it would be all anybody talked about on any newscast social media anything i just don't i, I don't know man i i felt i felt better like, you know, the first few times you reach for your phone, like the first day or so that you that you've quit social media, like, I think there's a fear of missing out. Like, I should be on here. It's, it's withdrawal, really. It's a withdrawal symptom, what you're feeling. It's withdrawal symptom because you, we have a habit of just grabbing our phone all the time. So I think I was kind of going through social media withdrawals, like this fear of missing out, like I should be on my phone, like what's going on? But once you're off of it for day two, day three, it's like you get this almost sense of calm about you because there's nothing just constantly triggering you. You know, there's nothing trying to trigger you. There's nothing, because that's what social media does, man. Them algorithms, they're set up to keep you on the platform so to keep you on the platform they have to do stuff they have to expose you to stuff that's going to elicit a reaction out of you right to keep you on there keep you engaged and so oftentimes that's going to be negative stuff Neg negativity will keep us on something longer than positive as bad as that is but that's just human nature now, I think it's probably just 
in our DNA, right? Survival, like we had to focus more time on the stuff that was gonna kill us back in the day when we were hunting and gathering and stuff. So I think it's just, I think it's just in us to focus more on the negative than the positive. But it, it, it can't be healthy. It can't be healthy for us. And I felt so much better. You know, part, I mean, nobody feels bad in Las Vegas, okay? It's just, a, it's a hell of a place to take a vacation to. There's so much to do. Nobody's going to feel bad in Las Vegas, but doing it outside of, with no social media, just living a little, being ignorant of anything going on. And you know what? Here's the thing, too. When I got back home, we flew out on a Friday, got home late late the next Monday night. And so I didn't get back on social media until Tuesday. So I had Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, four days off of social media. When I got back, I hadn't missed out on a damn thing. Here's another fish finally. We've been going through a dry spill. All them fish were stacked up in that one area, that bluff wall. We ain't got nothing down through here. We're about to work around this point right here right now, though. There's more chunk rocks down through here. It shallows out. There's a point that runs out. We're going to work our way around it. There's a pocket back here. If there ain't a bunch of bass fishermen in here, we may work our way back in this pocket, in this creek, whatever. But uh, four days I was off social media. When I got back on, I hadn't missed anything. That fear of missing out, it was just a fear. It was just something, uh, something social media has created inside us to feel. I hadn't missed out on anything. Nothing important. If something important happened, I'd have got a phone call. There's just, there's nothing on there that's, that you can't miss out on. So I think what I'm going to do is, and you know, and it's hard again, because I do this YouTube crap. I have to have a presence on social media. Like this is how, this is how I engage with people. But I think going forward, maybe like once a month, once, look at this, look at this osprey, man. He's got a big fish in his mouth, or his claws. I don't know what that was. Was that a drum? It was a pretty big fish. That thing was probably over a pound. Oh, he's back with, there he is. You see him? They got a nest right here on this pole. He's got a big fish in his claws. He's eating good today, buddy. Osprey. Oh, it's a white bass. He's got a big white bass. I was about to tell him if it's a crappie, the crappie fishermen are going to be lighting him up on social media for taking a crappie. <laughs> but I think like maybe once a month going forward, I may just like take a weekend off from social media just to put the phone down for a few days. I think it's going to be just just good for just good for the mental health. I think everybody should, but I don't know. That's just where we're at. So I don't I mean honestly, social media, the only thing I use it for is this this channel. Like I don't post anything personal on there cuz I just I don't feel compelled to, you know, I, I, I mean, hell, I don't even want people in my business. You know, I don't want them in my personal life. I don't, I don't understand why anybody would want to see what I ate for dinner tonight. <laughs> you know, like if I take a picture in front of the Bellagio water fountains out there in Las Vegas, like why? Why would anybody care to see? Yeah, people will hit the thumbs up button. They'll like the post. But like, why does anybody really care outside of just immediate family or something? Like, I, I don't feel compelled to post that stuff anymore. I pretty much, I will post pictures of fish, fishing related stuff just to 
kind of be advertisement for this YouTube channel. That's really the only thing I'd post anything on social media for. It's just advertisement for what I'm doing here for the YouTube channel. So that's where I'm at with it. But again, I ain't telling you what to do. If you want to be on social media, go be on social media. If it don't affect you in a negative way, well, good for you. If it does affect you in a negative way, just understand that it's probably because that algorithm is set up to affect you in a negative way because it keeps you on there. And so we all just got to make our own decision about what's best for us. But I don't, I just don't see at this point in time I don't know that the positives outweigh the negatives on social media. In the beginning, you know, it was like 100%, 90 to 100% positive, minimal negative. And now I think we've, we've went to the other side of the pendulum where it's 90, 90 plus percent negative stuff and about 10% good on social media. Well, the pendulum has swung. I guess eventually it'll come back down to somewhere in the middle. And, and, and again, it's one of those things, it's like the regulations on fat people on airplanes. What do you do about it? I mean, part of social media's problem is there's all these fake accounts that are just on there just to get a reaction out of people right how do you eliminate those well you gotta you need to verify people's identity right well how do you do that well you gotta verify their identity so then you're up in people's business you're up in their privacy that's no good you know so that's not a that's not a good solution so it's like you're trading one problem for another in that situation I don't know, man. I, 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 but the problem with not having, like, proving that people are actually legit people, in addition to just the fake accounts, too, is just the the ability to say stuff and not like people will say stuff online that they would never say in real life because they say it with a screen name like nobody knows who they are so if you eliminate those screen names and you've got an actual person there you can see who they are maybe that changes some of it but again in order to do that what do you got to do well you got to verify that they are who they say they are so in order to do that it's like when i went through that verification process there on Facebook so that I could try to take out those fake accounts and stuff. I had to send in my damn driver's license to verify my identity and all that. And it's like, do, do I really want to give that over to Facebook? No, I don't want to do that. And now you'd be asking pretty much everybody to do that. And I'm like, that's, that's not a solution. So I don't know what the answer is. I don't even know what the answer is to getting our jig back out of this tree that I cast too close to. I told you not to cast over here. I told you not to. And you done it anyway. What'd y'all do that for? We're going to get to use our, our fancy jig knocker here. We ain't used it this whole trip yet. I teased you with it a couple times. This might be the time to do it. Where did we go? Let's see where we're at here on the camera. That way I can see. So I'm going to slide that in that little groove, and I'm going to turn it. Okay, so now this is going to slide up my line. Let's see if I lose it and the... It's going to bounce it up and down there and try to knock it. Okay, there it can. I'll be damned. It worked. We just saved a... Spent a few dollars on this thing so I could save a 10-cent jig. If you save enough of them 10 cent jigs, this thing pays for itself. Again, I, I forget the name of these things. Trout Magnet sells them. But I can't remember the name of them. But I picked up some just to, just to try out because I, 
I had hoped to save some time. It don't bother me so much to retie if I break off, but I hate to subject y'all to it while I'm doing an unedited video. So I was trying to save a little time with those and I think that may work out. Just keep one in my life jacket and one in this kayak, one in my other kayak. And well, this fish right here is mad. This fish here, he said he's going to go type out. A, he's going to be one of the people that types out an essay about me on the social media. Them people that do that though, man. Every time I see, if I'm scrolling through and I see that crap, I'm like, what a loser. I'm like, that, like, you see that, I mean, they're writing out a damn essay because you used the crappie as bait. I'm like, man, that guy, that guy needs him a woman. And he ain't going to get no woman because ain't no woman going to want to listen to him vent and rant about that crap all the time. Because somebody kept a crappie and used it for bait to catch a huge catfish. Like, can you imagine being a woman? Uh, maybe, you know, I guess if you was an ugly woman and you was desperate, you'd probably listen to any man. But, like, if you was an attractive woman and all the man wanted to talk about was another man that he don't even know using crappie as bait and he was all tore up about it, like, you ain't going to want to hop in the sack with that guy. You know what I mean? These fellas, man, they, they got no sense. That's why they can't get women, though. There's a bunch of them, though, man. That comment box. I mean, I was scrolling down through there. There were so many people blasting me. I didn't know a single one of them. I mean, there were some people in there that kind of had my back and stuff. You know, people that knew, knew it was my video that had been stolen. Like, they would tag me and say, you know, at least give Justin credit or whatever for the video and defend me and stuff. But, like... The people that didn't know me or the random crappie fishermen, like, man, they were just lighting me up. And I don't understand. This is another thing I don't understand. They claim, a lot of them claim their problem with it is I was using sport fish. Crappie's a sport fish. Who, why did we determine that crappie are considered sport fish? There's another blue. Well, these things are out off this point a little bit. We got up there closer. We wasn't getting them, and now we're now they're up on here. We'll keep making our way. We'll keep casting out till we stop catching them here. But like, why is it determined that crappie were sport fish to begin with? You know, if I use skipjack, I can keep a whole cooler full of skipjack. Nobody bats an eye. Nobody cares. Skipjack are way more fun to catch, just from a fight perspective. They're acrobatics, jumping up and down out of the water. You never gonna see a crappie jump three foot in the air. Okay, that ain't gonna happen. They're never gonna fight as hard as a skipjack. But yet, I can keep 50 skipjack in a cooler. Nobody gives the first crap. But you keep one crappie, you're the devil. Why is it, how did it come about that crappie got deemed a sport fish and something like a skipjack didn't? Same thing with the carp. Here in America, carp are considered trash fish. You go across the world to the other side, carp are considered a sport fish. Like who's, why, why is one fish deemed sport and another trash? I don't understand. Like who comes up with this stuff? A fish is a fish is a fish, I guess. Like, you know, I, I view them all as, I want to use small fish to catch bigger fish. That's what I want to do. When I'm catching small fish, I want to catch them on an ultralight rod so I can have as much fun with them as I can. But ultimately, I want to catch big fish too. And so I'll use small fish to catch big fish. I don't care about species, none of that stuff. It's just the only fish that I really hate is channel cats. And I only hate them because here where I live, they're kind of the runts 
of the catfish world down there. We've got blues that get big. We've got flatheads that get big. And then here we've got channel cats, which don't. Now, granted, some places you go up like Sandusky Bay, you can catch some big channel cats up there. Down here in Tennessee, where I'm at, boy, you catch a 10-pound channel cat, you've caught something, buddy. Like, we just don't grow them that big here. And so what we end up with is these small runts that just chew up your bait when you're trying to catch a trophy blue or flathead. They're down there just chewing it up, ripping it off the hook. They're a nuisance. And so I about pull that jig right. I about put your eye out with that one. I gotta fix this gulp on here. We're gonna flip it upside down and rehook it. So that's my biggest thing with channel cats is they're just, they're the runts of the catfish here and they steal my bait or when I'm ultralight fishing, they'll tear up my jigs and then spin and flop around and stuff and get my line all messed up. But otherwise, to me, man, a fish, fish, I just want to catch them. Whatever's going to give me the best fight, that's what I want to catch. I only fish for catfish most of the time here. It's not that I'm just super loyal to wanting to catch catfish, but they're the biggest fish that swims here in my home water. So that's why I want to catch them. When I go, like if I take a trip somewhere, do I necessarily want to go catfishing? Not necessarily. You know, if I go down to, if I go down to the beach, I, you can catch some catfish down in Florida, but I don't go there to catfish. If I go that far, I'm gonna go down and try to catch some sharks because I want to catch something big. So, I, I don't know. I don't know who come up with this concept of what's a sport fish and what's not. But they need to reevaluate their lives. I get for legality purposes, you know, some fish are managed. Here comes a bass fisherman. Hope he goes down that other side. So we're going to work our way around this point. But, you know, I'm going to comply with whatever laws is in whatever state I'm in fishing at the time. I will comply. I'm not going to go out there and just break laws. I'm not going to use fish that they have deemed to be undersized. I'm not going to use species of fish that they have deemed are ineligible to be used for bait. But everything else, though, if it's legal size and a legal species, it's fair game. Because I just need something to put on a hook most of the time. Now, this afternoon, I'm going to go out... I'm going to leave here. I'm going to go home and do some chores. I'm going to go out this afternoon. I'm going to try to catch some skipjack. I'm going to go upriver. So there are a dime a dozen up there right now. I mean, they're everywhere where they've all made their spawning run. But I'm going to do that and then hopefully get after that. I hope. <laughs> I hope to get back on some cats again soon, man. It's been a just a rough go of it lately i'll bust out of the slump eventually and we'll get back to doing some catfish videos i got to do a tournament next weekend down on chickamauga and i ain't even been down there to practice yet like i had hoped to already have been down there and kind of got a plan together but the wind and the weather's just been uh, it's just knocked me out of going. I don't want to drive that far and only get to fish for two or three hours because of the weather. So I just ain't been, but I got to get down there because we got that tournament next weekend. It's on the 20th. Oh, oh, here's something for you. I forgot. I got to make it now. I got to do some damn social media stuff when I get home today because I have completely forgot to do this. Um, Friday night, April 19th. 2024 if you're seeing this video a year or two later uh but next friday the 19th in chattanooga at catfish sumo headquarters i will post the address info somewhere i'll post it on social media 
so if you follow me there even though i hate social media we're gonna post it there because i have to uh but anyway we're having like a, the night before the tournament we have to do our board check where we get our measuring boards approved and all that and get our tournament identifiers catfish sumo is sponsoring the tournament trail this year and so since the chickamauga tournament is right there in catfish sumo's backyard because their headquarters is in chattanooga tennessee they're having the check-in at catfish sumo's location there so uh, daniel the owner is going to have an open house everyone is invited 6 p.m to 8 p.m uh, so if you're in the chattanooga area or reasonable drive you want to come out please hey come on out i'd like to meet you shake your hand hang out with you i think daniel's going to have some food there uh, pizzas and stuff at least he did last year uh, so come out grab your bite to eat hang out um, i won't have my kayak there friday night because uh, with this tournament being close enough to home i'm just going to drive down saturday morning to fish so i'm going to go down there friday night for the check-in and whatnot and then i'll come home grab the kayak and go back saturday morning but a lot of the other guys that are from out of town they will have their kayaks there so if you want to come see some of their setups and stuff uh be a great time to do so and i'll be there i may even have daphne the dog there possibly there may be a daphne the dog sighting at this meet and greet if she's good between now and then i'm gonna i'm gonna take her down there she's been a pretty good girl lately she ran off the other night but she's been pretty good overall so i may take her down there but anyway 6 to 8 p.m on friday the 19th 2024 again if you're watching this video two years after the fact don't show up on the 19th because i ain't gonna be there but 19th april 19th 2024 6 to 8 p.m catfish sumo headquarters we'll hang out we'll have a good time i'm gonna hopefully get down there this week figure out a plan of where i want to go what i want to do hopefully have more success there than what i've had here at home the last couple weeks can't do much worse that's for sure but hopefully i'm on a winning streak you know i won that last tournament there first one of the year it may only be a streak of one but you got to start somewhere folks so got that going on i think we have i may be telling a lie here i'm not 100 percent certain on this but i think we have two tournaments in may i think there's one on the ohio river in kentucky earlier mid-may and then we're on nickajack in the at the end of may i'm pretty sure there's two in the month of may and i think daniel if you if you're not able to attend this friday the meet and greet there at catfish Sigma. if you're not able to attend it i'm pretty sure they're going to do it again next month for the nickajack tournament because it's also there chickamauga is right above nickajack like the two reservoirs are back to back there so i think they'll probably have the check-in there at catfish sumo again next month so if you miss this month we'll probably be doing it again there in may as well i don't know the date the exact date off the top of my head for that one though but i'll i'll announce something about it beforehand i should have already done that for this one i forgot i just remembered i'm a busy man y'all there's only so much knowledge you can store in one brain and i'm at capacity right now where are we at on time this wind's starting to pick up I don't know if y'all notice on camera, but it's it's kind of starting to pick up a little bit. I knew the weatherman said it was going to pick up this afternoon, but I think we're still early enough in the day. It wouldn't hit me then. I didn't think it would be. A, I was hoping we'd have more time than this. I don't even know what time it is. I don't know. Actually, well, I don't know what time I got started because I didn't get out here at sunrise. I slept in a little bit, trying to let it warm up a bit. 
and it's gotten warm now i need to lose this hoodie is what i need to do but i'm gonna wait till we stop filming first oh here we go what's this is this right here the bluegill yeah it's bluegill that's shulker no it's bluegill well he hit it hard that's a different maybe some kind of sunfish maybe he's got some different colors there on him maybe a bluegill i don't know they're all bluegill to me every one of them's a bluegill to me i can tell the shell crackers apart because they've got that red ear but beyond that they're all bluegill tell you something else i'm gonna do too when i get out of here is i'm gonna hit my nasal spray for this allergies man this pollen's blowing around i can i can't believe i ain't sneezing yet i need to blow my nose but i'm gonna wait till we're done filming i want subjections to it here's another one this wind's blowing in here in this area and i wonder course we've caught fish all the way down through here with the exception of that one little dry spell we had that one dry spell there on that one part of the bluff wall and that, but otherwise we pretty much caught fish the whole way it's been a good day for numbers that's for sure i'm happy with it this is the most production i have had most productive trip i've had in a while y'all The wind lately has just been every day. It's just been cranking. And, you know, when you're in a kayak, there just ain't much you can do in 15 plus mile an hour winds. It's just a, a miserable experience. And there's been a couple days where I've got out and tried to do some bank fishing. I hit a ledge one day bank fishing and one day I was in a backwater creek bank fishing. And I just didn't, y'all didn't see the footage from it because there wasn't nothing to see. I mean, they just, I just ain't been catching them. I don't know why I haven't been catching them, but I ain't. And when I, you know, and here's the thing, before I went to Vegas, the fish I was getting was dragging. And since I've been home, I've been trying to suspend more. Because we're at that time of year where the flathead bite typically picks up and I don't catch as many fish. I don't catch hardly any flatheads dragging. I catch a bunch suspended, but very few dragging. So I've been spending more time suspending baits. But the suspended bite just ain't, it ain't been on where I have been at the time I've been there. And when I've been in these creeks and stuff, I just pull up on the bank air and, you know, cast out, obviously. Fish on bottom, but I ain't done no good there either. Just some small fish and you get turtled to death. So, I don't know. I'm, I may... I fish tomorrow. If I get some bait this afternoon and I fish tomorrow, I'm probably going to do some dragging. Just to see what that'll do for me. We don't have hardly any current flow right now. It's feast or famine this time of year. You either get a bunch of rain and the generators are on, their spill gates are open, it's current full blast, or you don't have any rain and they're not running any current at all. And that's kind of been the case. We've had some rain lately, but not enough to where they've got to spill water or turn on all the generators or anything. And so they've not been hardly running anything you get one or two generators on for a few hours a day. So there's not been any flow. And I don't know if maybe that's played a role in it or not, but it could just be that I suck at catfishing. <laughs> at least that's how I feel right now, folks. I feel like I suck at it. There's another bass boat behind us. We've been fortunate thus far with the bass boats. I thought we'd be covered up with them. Had we fished in the creek I launched in, we'd have been we'd have been hopping around people all 
all morning. Coming out to the main channel, I think, was the ticket to buy us a little, a little privacy today. I'm peopled out this week, man. I need to get a break from it. You just gotta. This is the, this is the a good way. Get out of the water, ultralight rod in your hands. One of the best ways to get away from people. Just come out here, catch some fish, catch a lot of fish. Have some fun, man. I love doing this. And you don't, I mean, I mean, aside from a day, aside from a day where the wind's real bad, like right now it's, it's blowing enough that it's, it's gonna make it hard to fill by. I mean, you probably can't see with the sun and the glare, but there's a bow in my line right now where that wind's coming in. Like it's not blowing super hard, but it's blowing just enough to make things difficult but aside from a real windy day here's fish didn't feel him i just went to pick up on it he's there but you, you don't have a bad day doing this unless you're just out trying to do it on a windy day if, if there's a hurricane blowing through you ain't gonna have a good time ultralight fishing but the rest of the time if it's normal conditions if it's calm conditions don't matter what time of year like you're gonna have a good time you're gonna catch some fish i just enjoy the hell out of it and i've been wanting to do it so bad uh, that that'll make you want it more than anything when you can't do it because like you wake up and you want to go like man i want to go ultralight fishing day and you you open up your weather app you're like oh man 15 20 mile an hour winds you look out the window and the trees are swaying you're like damn i can't go today and that makes you want to go even more and so i kind of been pent up like that so this, this is nice getting out here to do it today and it's great to get the number of fish that we've got i'd like to have got a few more species obviously i knew I knew our chances of a crappie today was going to be slim because they're up there in the creeks right now. They're up. They're getting most. I think they're probably on the nest right now, truth be told. But either way, we'd have probably picked off some of the brush. But um, I would have liked to have gotten some other species today. It wouldn't hurt my feelings to catch bass or a drum or something like that. Maybe yellow bass or white bass. But I'm happy with what we've got. I mean, I've, I've enjoyed it. I even got to see a deer. <laughs> we, saw, we saw Bambi in the making. Here comes the wind. That, that wind right there will really mess us up. It's going to blow like that. It's gusting right now. I fixed my thing on my camera, so hopefully it won't be too annoying when it does gust. My, my what do you call them things? Wind muffs? They're pieces of fur. They go over your microphone. I don't know what they're called. You know what I'm talking about, though. Mine had, one of mine had come off on my camera recently. I think the rain had got it or something. I finally remembered to fix that thing. So we shouldn't have too much wind noise on the camera, even when it does gust. It doesn't bother me because these unedited videos, I don't watch. But <laughs> you know, for those of you out there who are kind enough to watch, I'm sure it's uh, annoying to you. I believe of all the great things about these unedited videos for me number one would be not having to watch myself because when i edit a video before i publish it i have to watch it back to make sure that i haven't left something in that wasn't supposed to be in there you know hence editing you cut part of the video out but in order to make sure that i haven't left something in i have to watch it i hate watching myself on camera like I guess 
uh, you know, you, you have all these signs of different types of people and stuff. Like, that's how I'm pretty sure I'm not a narcissist because I don't like watching myself. <laughs> so, you know, when you have when you, when you have these girlfriends in your past, you're like, you're such a narcissist. I know I'm not because I don't like... I think if I was a narcissist, I would enjoy watching myself. And I don't. So, I'm a lot of things. Some of them are vulgar. But narcissist, I don't think I am. I think I'm innocent on that one. You know what I kind of want to do? Where are we at? Three hours in here on this video. Which means we're probably around midday. Looking at the sun in the sky. That's the real clock up there. I guess we are around midday now. You know what I kind of want to do before I wrap it up? Because the wind is picking up a little bit. I kind of want to run back up there to that part of the bluff wall since it's been a little while. What's it been? Probably an hour since we were up there where we were getting the better quality bluegill. I'd kind of like to go hit that again before the wind picks up anymore. We make our way around in this creek. There's going to be a another boat over there which I don't really want to interact with you know again I'm trying not to people today let's do this let's go over here let's fish these two docks and then let's take off and go up there and hit that spot with the bluegill again before the before the wind kicks up anymore let's just, this dock over here looks like it might be too shallow I don't know how much water, I don't know how deep we are right now, honestly. We're at least going to throw it around a few times. We'll either catch fish or we won't. Ain't but one way to find out. Oh yeah, it's super shallow. I see the bottom right there. Yeah, we'll probably we'll catch that around this. Yeah, it's super shallow. Wonder if that other one over there's got any more depth to it. literally see the bottom right there. I just throw back up in there in the shade. Just for doo-doos and giggles. Yeah. Yeah, let's fish this. This other one up here sticks out a little further. Maybe it's got a little bit more depth to it. Just throw over there toward that rip wrap. Wind just all of a sudden, man, it's kicking up. When it blows that bow in your line, these jigs are so light. When you're throwing a 164th ounce, it blows the jig. So you got to use a heavier jig, which then causes the jig to fall down faster, which will, in my opinion, limit some of your bites on that. So it's just kind of the wind just sucks when you're ultra light fishing. It's the number one number one enemy of ultralight fishing but this time of year it's just windy here's something else i was thinking about the other day too yeah i'm out here i'm talking whatnot i bet you some of these docks i fish around probably have those cameras look i got those cameras set up at my house the ring security cameras I got mine set up to keep people from, well, it ain't going to keep nobody from stealing anything, but I'll catch them in the act if they try to steal something. I was thinking, I bet some of these docks I fished around probably have those cameras set up and like I trigger them because I get so close fishing and then they sit there and hear everything I'm saying, whether I'm talking to a camera, talking on the phone, whatever. Like they're eavesdropping, I bet. <laughs> I can only imagine some of the stuff I've said while being recorded that I had no idea I was being recorded. I tell you what though, if I was, well, I would never have a place like this. I'm way too cheap to be living on the lake. I want to live close to the lake 
but at a major discount of the lake life. But if I was a place like this, you better believe I'd have him camera set up. The way stuff walks off in today's society, you got to believe everything on these. I'm sure, I'm sure it's, it's, you know, I, I'm not part of that community, obviously. I don't know people. I don't hang out with people who live on the lake, but I bet you when they get together for their hors d'oeuvres at their social gatherings, they all talk about how they've been robbed of stuff off their docks. I guarantee when the, when the waiters take around, an hors d'oeuvre is what rich people call appetizers, by the way, in case you didn't know. When they're taking around their plates of hors d'oeuvres, they're talking about what they got robbed of on their docks, I bet you. But I'd have Mason security cameras for sure. If you got enough money to have a place on the lake, you got enough to get you some security cameras. Mine was cheap. It was like $100. It just connects into your Wi-Fi. And it's got a motion detector on it. So somebody gets near my stuff, it starts recording and sends me an alert on my phone. So it's helpful. Fortunately, I ain't had no issues, but if you ever did, you at least get some video footage of what's going down. Seem to be much happening here. All right, I'll tell you what let's do. We're gonna run up here a second and make some more casts for them bluegill. But on the way, we're gonna troll our skipjack rods and just see, see if we get lucky with, whether it's skipjack or white bass or lard, anything, it don't matter. Let's just troll our way up there. Get my, there we go. Get that jigging done. Okay. There's one. We're going to swing out a little bit too because this uh, point here comes out a little ways. We kind of fish the top of it there just in the shallows when we come down, but uh, work around that of the rod there. We're going to swing out so we don't get these jigs caught in the, in the shallows as we work through. Like I said, I don't know if we're going to get anything or not coming out through here, but when you're trolling, in a kayak like this pedal kayak most of the time if i'm just casually pedaling um two and a half miles an hour three miles an hour as the wind hits perfect trolling speed now if a storm's coming uh if i need to rush back i gotta get out of here get home or something i can i can pedal faster and get myself up four miles an hour, four and a half miles an hour. But that's not comfortable to do. It's not comfortable to sustain. You can do it for short bursts, but I'm not trying to run anywhere in the kayak. You know, I just want to walk casually to the next, to wherever I'm going. And walking casually is about two and a half three miles an hour with this setup so you might as well have you some baits trolling behind you as you go because you just never know when you're going to run across a school or something or you know come across a random bass or something just you know this time of year and the location like i'm i guess this would be considered lower end 
that's four loud L lower to bottom middle i guess uh, all of these skipjack in here right now are at the very top of the way up the river that's where most of them are at on their spawning run so probably not going to get any but we might get something else and we're heading back up here anyway so no reason not to do it and honestly i should even when i'm in my other kayak with the motor i should troll a bait with it too all the time i don't because typically i'm going full speed spot to spot and so that's like four and a half miles an hour ish which is you know faster I mean, if you're trolling a rattle trap or something, you might pick off a bass. I've caught some striper doing that through the years, but the faster you go, the more you're limiting the bites you're going to get. So, but when I'm pedaling, though, no reason not to do it. You know something else it ain't gonna be on today's list to do but soon i need to wash this kayak something about the i guess because it's a darker color i don't know if you can see with the glare up there but the pollen all over this thing man the yellow pollen on this dark color kayak it really shows up i gotta wash that off there comes that boat part of the reason i didn't want to go down the other part of that little pocket there is because them other guys is fishing down there and i'll be damned here they come that's all right though this wind is kicking up here so i'm gonna just go up here and work this air with the bluegill wire again make a few casts and i'll probably get out of here and go do some chores there at the house get some stuff done and eat some lunch and then go get after some bait I got my, I've talked about the, have I talked about it on the, I know I've talked about it with my channel members, because I do some extra videos there for them around the house and stuff, but I'm pretty sure I've mentioned it before on the unedited videos too, that I've got a raised bed garden I'm working on this year, and I got some stuff planted in there yesterday. This guy's waving. Y'all wave back. I guess he's idle. I don't know if he's idling to get in front of me. Okay, now he's about to take off. He's just being nice, I guess. Courteous bass fish. I'm surprised we ain't seen more bass fishing, honestly. Even just working up and down the lake. I'm really surprised about that. They may have not have had a tournament down here at... Uh, at the bottom end today oh here's something here's something what's this what's going on oh crap i got my dang line wrapped around my rod tip let's see what this is y'all is this a skipjack it's something here. i still don't know what it is yeah it is it's a small one but it's a skipjack and big ones they're up there spawning right now these runts are probably what's left down here i don't know when a skipjack reaches maturity by gosh we just picked this one off here that's why you, that's a good reason right there folks that's why you troll by gosh troll from spot to spot because you just never know that skipjack right there he ain't gonna get us many baits maybe maybe two baits will get out of him but that's one skipjack i don't have to catch later but uh anyway i know i've talked about it with my channel members on my channel member videos but i think i've i've had to have talked about it in my unedited videos but anyway i got me a raised bed garden this year and so i've planted some stuff in there yesterday i got some pepper plants I planted my seeds last week. I, I did some cucumber seeds, 
and some uh, sugar snap peas. Cause I've got this trellis built. I'm gonna let those, those are gonna climb. And I did two cherry tomatoes yesterday and I think I did 10 total pepper plants. I did some bell peppers and some uh, banana peppers on those. And so I'm kind of just doing just a few plants this year, just stuff that I'm gonna eat I don't want to have a bunch of excess like I have in years past when I when I tilled up a big area of the garden. But uh, I got all that stuff done yesterday. I need to, I need to pick me up. I got more space than I thought I was gonna have, so I gotta get me one more tomato plant. And I need to get me some uh, marigolds too. Throw them little yellow orange flowers, and those apparently are pretty good for keeping bug, some bugs off of your tomatoes. So I'm gonna just gonna plant some of those in there as well. Make it look good, you know. Let's go over here and make a few casts in this area where we were getting the bluegill while we can. Because this wind keeps picking up. And before long, we're not going to be able to cast and be able to feel anything with our jig. Well, we got us a little bonus skipjack there for those of you that come trolling with me. This area right, so right up here was that little indention there where we were getting the smaller bluegill. And right here was where we were getting the bigger ones. Let's just see what we can do. Hopefully this water will calm down a little bit and all these boats going by. I don't know. We'll get any more action here or not, but there was a, obviously a large number of bluegill here earlier. And it's been probably, I don't know, probably an hour, I guess, since we were through here, so. Look at my line though, man. That wind is blowing a huge bow in it. My jig's just getting pulled across the water right now. When that wind turned on, it turned on, man. It's like hitting a, hitting a button on your granny's electric fan. My great grandma, I'd stay with her when I was a kid. And she always, she never wanted to turn on the air conditioner in the summer. She didn't, she didn't have like central heat and air. She had like a window unit air conditioner, but she never wanted to turn it on. So it'd be in there, it'd be a hundred degrees in that house, but she'd have a fan going and it'd be one of them circulating fans. Like it would, I think that's what they're called. Like it would slowly turn and it'd blow sideways for a second and then it would turn back. And as a kid, you just, you'd be there watching TV. You'd be laying there watching wrestling and laying in front of that fan, trying to just let that fan blow the sweat off your forehead that was beating up because it's so damn hot in there. <laughs> and it'd be hot in there in the winter too because she had a coal burning stove. And so it, it was, there wasn't no way to control that. You just, it's just hot. It's hot in that house. Seven days a week, 365. <laughs> Hopefully we can catch a fish or two here in between the wind gusts. They were all over it when we come through here the first time, though. I mean, they were very aggressive they were up high they these fish too as the as the mornings went on they may move lower because i mean this bluff wall it comes down i mean i'm sure we're probably sitting in 20 feet 30 feet of water here where we're at this far out from it so those fish can easily they're not necessarily going to move up in the shallows per se if they're on this bluff wall but they can move vertically up and down 
into shallower water over deeper water, if that makes sense. Here's just one. And grab hold of you fish, you liable to fly away like a kite. I'll be flying a bluegill on the fishing pole. I actually thought about getting me a kite. I ain't flown a kite since I was a kid, and even then I wasn't no good at it. But I thought about getting one. Windy as it's been lately, when I've been stuck at the house, that'd be something, something to do. Well, I've just been hanging out with old Daphne the dog. She's act, I mean, I'm, every time, I'm gonna jinx it by saying it. Every time I think we've turned the corner with Daphne, and she starts to kind of behave better, she, she'll do something to ruin it and make me realize what a fool I was to, to think we had turned the corner. But in the last couple weeks, we've really only had like one, she ran off and she didn't even run off on me. In, in her defense, she ran off on my girlfriend. She had come over, I was gone fishing. She got there, she got to my house before I did. And she let Daphne out and Daphne ran off. So she didn't run off on me. But other than that, I mean, she's been very well behaved lately. She seems to be calming down. Like she's still a very high energy dog, but like, she's not as just constantly she sleeps more now i guess is what i'm getting at like she don't I pulled one out of one's mouth right then she don't uh she don't go 24 7 now like she used to i mean she was the dang energizer bunny there for the longest time i mean you just it didn't matter how hard you run her you couldn't you couldn't get the energy out of her but now she's starting to mellow out a little bit. Her and I, I think, are bonding. She's becoming a better dog for me. She was never a bad dog, per se, but she just wasn't a good dog for me for the last year, year and a half, you know, that I've, hell, I don't even know how long it's been since I've had her now. I guess this summer will make two years. So we're coming up on two years now. So during in the last year and a half, Daphne has not, she's not been a bad dog, but she's not been a good dog for me. But she's turning into one, I think. I think we're finally reaching the point where maybe her and I are gonna enjoy each other's company a little more. <laughs> Cause I'm not having to yell at her and she's not having to be yelled at. So it's better for both of, both of us. But I'm gonna try to take her down there to the Catfish Sumo event on Friday night. And, uh, cause she's, I get a lot of people in the comment box every time I race a bicycle with her. Oh, and speaking of that, I did get a new bicycle the other day. Company, well, I can't remember the company's name now. I'll have to, I, I guess I should figure out what company it is that sent it to me. But one of them sent us a bike. So if I ever catch a catfish again, I'm gonna do a bicycle segment in that catfish video and have Daphne race it. So she's got her, uh, finally got her a new bike. This bike we got, it's got two motors on it. So we'll see if that can, these single motor bikes ain't been no match for. But we'll put, we'll try a bike with two motors. But it came the other day, I got it put together already. So one of those projects I was able to knock out cause I've been home. Boy, this wind, I mean, I, the wind's just pushing us down through here right now. We didn't really get anything over there, anything good over there where we got them bluegill out earlier. I'm gonna fish my way back here to this little pocket where we got to the smaller bluegill, see what's going on there. This is where Bambi was at here earlier. It's a wonder Bambi didn't fall down getting up that wall up there. 
The Bambi's got the skills of a mountain goat, man. And it's a pretty, this is a pretty wide section of the river. Bambi had a long swim to get over here. I didn't see no, maybe Bambi had friends and family that had already made the swim over. And they just run off and they said, we're tired of waiting on you. You just, if you want to catch up with us, call an Uber or something. That's what I did out there in Las Vegas. We took Uber everywhere this time. Normally ride the bus. I got to tell y'all some more Las Vegas stories. We'll, we'll do some more Las Vegas stories in the next video. I got some more. It was an interesting trip. Wasn't a, wasn't a profitable one. Gambling purposes anyway. Had more success on the dang scratch off tickets here at home than we did at the slot machine out there in Las Vegas, but had some had some good people watching. Had some fun times at the hockey game and went to the spear. That was a good time. There's a bluegill about ripped us off here. Let's make a couple more casts right here. I'm already, I can feel myself get a, getting annoyed by the wind and I don't want to be annoyed because we've had such a good day. I want to leave out of here in a good mood is what I've been in for the whole duration up to this point before the wind started blowing. All right, here we go. Last, maybe maybe one more cast. Of that wasn't a very good cast. I'm gonna let it sink down a little bit anyway, though, before I reel it in. Maybe these fish have moved a little deeper. The water out here is much clearer. The we did get some rain there yesterday and the day before. The creeks are just pure mud right now. Where I launched at, I mean, it's maybe an inch or two of visibility. I mean, it's mud. But out here, the water is significantly cleaner, so these fish can see this bait falling down. Be able to come out and snatch it. It's a different world right now, though, than when we come through here the first time, though, ain't it? I mean, he's, we were getting bit from here all the way around through there. We started getting the small ones here and then got on the bigger ones as we moved down. But, oh, here's one. I say that. Oh, I just pulled it out of his mouth. You danged old fish. Here I was. I was wanting to end this video on a fish, y'all. And that fish said he didn't want me to. He either didn't want me to end the video or he didn't want to be on the video. I'm guessing he probably just didn't want to be caught. I don't really take fish's feelings into consideration when I'm putting a hook in their jaw. It's more about me, really. These fish need to be as focused on my needs as I am. Yeah, the next unedited video we do, we'll get caught up on some Vegas stories. Well, I got, I got sidetracked on the fat people on the plane from Las Vegas this time. But I got more stories, by gosh. We're gonna, I promise you, we'll, we'll tell you some tales. Nobody tunes into these videos expecting to just see fish call, by gosh. We got a lot of stuff to talk about. All right, here's what I'm gonna do. I'm gonna make one more cast, whether I catch a fish or not. And we're gonna let mother nature just blow this wind all she wants. It won't affect me when I go catch skipjack this afternoon. Cause I'm gonna be trolling for them. The boy out here during this, it's really a nuisance. Now I'm gonna troll my way back to the car too. I may pick off another skipjack. If I do, it'll probably be a skinny one. Like that one we got there earlier. So what we end up with today, three bluegill, channel cat, skipjack. I don't know how many total. I'm sure fishing Key Largo will tell us. But 
either way y'all it's been a good time i've had fun today i hope you all have enjoyed coming with me i think oh i'm gonna i'm gonna ditch this hoodie here because we've reached that point today it's warming up it's nice man to be able to come out this time of year and it warm up <laughs> so all went along you know it just don't warm up you just cold from the time you get there and you're colder the time you leave at least now you start out cold and you're warm by the time you're ready to go but i'm gonna ditch this hoodie i'm gonna get turned around here i'm gonna troll my way back to the car see if i get some skipjack go home grab a bite knock out a few small projects around the house and get out this afternoon and hopefully load up on some bait and hopefully maybe no guarantees because again i suck lately but maybe the next video will be a catfish video i hope so anyway y'all thanks for coming along with me today i hope you have fun i sure have i'll see you in the next one thanks for watching